Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as as always by my good friend, my business partner, the the whiskey wizard himself, uh, the wonderful, uh, the inimitable, the fascinating, the ever fascinating, Jason Johnston Yellen. Welcome, as always, as per usual, to our podcast. Let me just say, Joshua, guilty as charged <laughs> to to all of the above. Mm-hmm. So thank mm-hmm. you for having me into our fifth season together. It's it's season five, and this is this is our third episode. And listen, we launched the episode with the wonderful Bill Lumsden. Did you mean season where you said episode? <laughs> I did. Thank you for correcting me for the past ten years. Well, so now, now I've learned I need to speak out loud when I correct you because making a face no longer registers. So I have to be more vocal. No, no. Things are going to change I, around here. See, you need to understand. Now, granted, I don't fall into this category, but you need to understand there's a category of people that can't recognize faces or social cues. And so you just making a face, you may find yourself with one of these people. And you're making the most horrific face at them, and they'll just keep going because they don't recognize it. My oldest son has that. Does he? Yep. He was diagnosed with that when he was uh, eight, nine, ten. It's like, yeah, he just didn't uh, recognize disgust on people's faces, or when somebody was giving him a look like, are you sure you want to keep doing that? Yeah. It just didn't register. Nope. Didn't register for him. So when he goes into the middle of the street to poop and people look at him in disgust, he's just like, what are you looking at? So let me tell you this. Oh, boy. Now that he's 14 and he's obviously eighth grade, transitioning after the summer from middle school to high school, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. peer pressure means absolutely nothing to him. Nothing at all. He wears his hair how he wants. He paints his nails how he wants. He wears his clothes however he wants. And there are times his mom and I are kind of like just quietly behind the scenes. Like, do we need to tell him not to wear it like that? Like thinking of what's coming down the line. And then our conclusion is always the same. Like it's absolutely water off a duck's back with him. Wow. Oh, he's so lucky. Kids Mm -hmm. can be, kids Mm -hmm. can be so Mm -hmm. relentless and terrible and if he just lets it all go off him, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. it's Good absolutely remarkable. So mm. there you go. Every cloud has a silver lining, Joshua. And so I thank you once again for, for your own little silver lining, always having you there in the distance to correct me whenever, whenever I need it. So you, you are my silver lining, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, we, so we kicked off the season with Bill Lumsden. We did. Wonderful start of the season. And then it was a follow-up with your conversation with Nick Ravenhall, which, from my perspective, was such an absolute joy to just go back and listen to because it, I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie here. I, I think that it was perhaps one of the most enjoyable, at least in the top two of enjoyable conversations that one of us have had on the podcast. I was captivated and excited and laughed and yeah feedback on that has been excellent as well the yeah. the number of listeners reaching out to say well done that was that was good fun nick was a good good interview which is absolutely true and, and actually just yesterday mm-hmm. i i uncovered a bit of context that made sense of a point nick had made in the interview oh at one point, Nick says when he took over Holyrood, mm-hmm. there was twenty-two thousand pounds in the bank. Yes, and he he talked about him going in with kind of a triage approach, right? Yeah. Or well, we yeah. might have to lose the leg, but let's see how we stitch the head back on, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in the moment, you hear, okay, twenty-two thousand pounds in the bank doesn't sound great, but the context that I unearthed is the funding for Holyrood. Mm. involved the the Canadian couple yeah. and and 60, 60 private investors. 
Uh, and okay. mm-hmm. they put together seven and a half million pounds for Holyrood. Wow. So when you hear <laughs> That's a number. there was twenty two thousand pounds left in the bank. Yeah. And it came from a starting fund of seven and a half million pounds. Yeah. Really gives you the sense, as as we love to say in Scotland, that they were on the bones of their arse. Mm. Right? We we don't love it when people are on the bones of their arse. But we do love that expression. We do use it a lot um, when things have just really gone badly. Yeah. So, wow. so yeah, I thought that context was interesting. And I, I wanted to remember to bring it up for, for our dear listeners to add in, you know, to, to, to further address, to add leaves to the branches of what mm. Nick had been saying uh, in that interview, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad glad the listeners enjoyed it. I obviously enjoyed it, and Nick emailed after the conclusion of it to say he thoroughly enjoyed it as well. So yeah, 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 it's good, good stuff. So yeah, season five is off to a good start, and now Joshua, I think I know where you're where you're leading us. Well, I mean, to be very honest, I, I was going to hand it over to you because the idea, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the, listen, the, the idea for today's episode, which I think is an absolute brilliant one, and, and of course the timing of it is perfect, came from you uh, oh, during gosh. a conversation that we had with Dave Broom in our, in, our, mm. in our last interview with Dave Broom. And of course, mm-hmm. he's one of the people on, you know, on today's episode, along with Hans and Becky Ofringa and... Um, a woman named Carol, a.k.a. The Beer Fox. Wonderful and nickname. Wonderful nickname. So could you share with the listeners the idea behind today's episode? Yeah, 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 yeah. So so back in, gosh, I, I want to introduce it, but without saying too much of what we then covered with our friend Dave Broom. Um, what, what was the impetus for me? When I was cutting my teeth in whiskey, there was Whiskey Magazine. Mm. And it probably came out around the, the mid-90s. And I, I remember in the later 90s, I would see Dave Broom and Michael Jackson's tasting notes side mm. by side. Mm-hmm. And so, so to my mind, Dave is one of the, the few people w- with whom we have contact and, and a very good relationship where we had a connection to the late, great Michael Jackson, mm. the, the beer hunter, the whiskey chaser, um, <laughs> the, the other Michael Jackson, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, as not, sometimes not, described. Not hee <laughs> but, you know, drink, drink. No, drink. Not, not the single glove wearer. So, and so I, I wanted to have a conversation. I wanted you and I to have a conversation mm. sometime in March with Dave Broom, as we approached Michael Jackson's birthday, which mm-hmm. is a well-known date in whiskey circles, March 27th. Mm-hmm. And, and I wanted us to have a, an access point to remember Michael. And, you know, he died in, in 2007. Mm-hmm. And you and I... Well, I, I started blogging 2009. You started blogging 2010. No, you always get the dates wrong. You always get the years wrong. My first blog post was uh-huh. in February 2009. Yeah. Is that true? It is true. Cause I, because uh, I thought it was 2008. And then you, my silver lining, uh, <laughs> w- 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 were there to correct me. I feel like this is how Pinocchio, in a quiet moment, might describe Jiminy Cricket. But <laughs> but in louder moments, he doesn't describe Jiminy Cricket nearly as, as nicely. So I appreciate in this quiet moment that uh, I am being described as your silver lining. Oh, shit. I think it might be. Oh, oh here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Hold on, Please, hold on, hold Joshua, on. Joshua, now that you've done research oh, live no, 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 during no, the recording. No, oh, no, oh no, gosh, this no. is a roller coaster. Hold on, hold on. This is a roller coaster. We're, get, we're going to get this. We're going to get this right. Because, Jason, if you recall, if you oh recall, 
Uh-huh. The the very first review I ever did was of okay. Ardbeg Ugadal. I do remember that. I have reread that in passing years. <sighs> February eighteenth. Yes. Two thousand. Yes. And yes. Not eight. <laughs> not eleven. Not, not eleven. <laughs> <laughs> and also not nine. It was 2010. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad we have on wax you calling me your silver lining. Oh, oh, gosh. And it, Hold on. Yeah. Let me just light a cigarette over here. <laughs> just give me a give me a moment. I gotta pour a special dram. I gotta light a cigarette. I tried to tarnish my silver lining. You see what I did there? <sighs> so yes, you started blogging in 2009. I started blogging in 2010. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh-huh. both of those dates mm-hmm. are are after the passing of Michael Jackson. Yes, they are. And so, so you and I, you know, weren't necessarily dealing with ambassadors and dealing with journalists and dealing with you know a host of whiskey events at mm-hmm. th- at the time of his passing or or before, and so. All we really know about Michael Jackson are his books, his articles, yeah. his yeah. tasting notes in Whiskey Magazine, the Beer Hunter program, mm-hmm. which aired on Channel 4 in the UK and Discovery Channel in the United States back in 1989. Uh, so that was, that was, and that was even before, you know, Christ, you and I were, you know, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, so exactly. So, so we didn't really have have occasion or reason to know Michael, and and I knew that Dave would help us change that, which is why mm-hmm. it came up organically in the conversation. But then also, you've got a, a very lovely relationship with with Hans and Becky, yes. and and yep. you've even spent time with with Hans in New Haven in Connecticut. And and don't don't forget, we had him on the podcast. I think it was season two. We interviewed him about his writing as well. So yeah, is that when some... you were you were at Maltstock by yourself? Is that where you interviewed him, or did you interview him as part of his Northeast United States trip? I let me tell you something. So this was this was my first time at Maltstock, and my first okay. time in the Netherlands, and okay. Hans and Becky took me in as if I was their family. It was such a wonderful experience. They made me feel at home. And and then just just getting to spend an, an hour or so with, with Hans in some random hallway inside the malt stock premises just, just to get a little alone time to talk about, you know, to talk about his writing. Yeah, it was it was, it was a great time. And so when this idea percolated the idea came up naturally with Dave Broom. And then we said, oh, we've got to reach out to Hans because Hans and Michael were also incredibly close. Oh, incredibly yes. close. Yes. So. Yep. Yep. Well, and, and then some of the information that Hans has shared over email, mm. some of the photos, some of the stories, uh, that, gosh, they're, they come across as brothers in arms. Yeah, and the, the yeah. fact that Hans was doing translating for Michael, but then, as you rightly say, Hans has got his own whiskey writing, separate yeah. from Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah. But there they were, brothers in arms, and so there's there's a lot in in both of today's interviews, from Dave to Hans to Becky to Carol, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. really gives us selfishly, mm-hmm. but also our listeners. And I, I know a lot of our listeners are, are of an age with us mm-hmm. and and their journey teased up against the edges of Michael Jackson. Yeah. But there's also an awful lot of our listeners who are younger than us mm-hmm. and who really even cut their teeth on whiskey after the passing of Michael Jackson. Yeah. And so yeah. for, for someone, and, and again, I don't want to take words out of Dave's mouth, but for someone like Michael Jackson, who is so influential on so many spirits writers and beer writers mm. who came behind him, mm-hmm. his role is is hugely important in the history of our industry. Yes. And I am very excited to to share these conversations with our listeners today. 
So, okay, with that in mind, so you're aware and so our listeners are aware. The way this is going to work out is we're about to hand off our conversation between you, me, and Dave Broom, and then you'll hear a little, a little break after that, and then it's going to transition to our conversation with Hans and Carol the Beer Fox. And, and, then, and then we'll come out of that. We'll, we'll have a little bit of news for everybody. We've got a fantastic email to, to read for people, which I think ties into the news a little bit. And, uh, and then we'll let you get on your merry way. How does that sound, Jason, for a plan? It sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy this day. As am I. Yeah, Dave, I think we started, we suggested this episode the last time we spoke with you and, and you were enthusiastic about it. And so you were the wind in our sails to, oh, to press ahead with it. Yes, that's, <laughs> there's, there's no finer compliment. The wind beneath uh, your wings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta cue that song up. Yeah, love, love, lift us up where we belong. Um, so on, on Monday, we're actually going to spend some time with Hans Offringer, of course, and and talk about Michael with him as well. Cool. So we're we're going to try and build a you know a few perspectives cool. uh, for the for the episode because obviously, you know, as we've said along the way, neither one of us ever had the opportunity to meet Michael even though he was my whiskey sensei. It was the third edition of the Malt Whiskey Companion that me and my buddy Petty leafed through constantly and and kind of learned about the spirit and learned about distilleries and house styles from that. And so, you know, it, it's amazing to have someone like Michael, who I, I feel has, has been right behind me my entire journey, but never met him. So this is an attempt to, to get closer to the chap. So from the very beginning, how did the two of you meet? And when did the two of you meet? Oh, uh, well, the two of us, I, I first came across him when he did Beer Hunter on, on telly on Channel 4 in, in the UK. Uh, and I, 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 I kind of think back and this might just be kind of, you know, the past, yeah, the, the the way you kind of you, you look back on things, but maybe that that was a stimulus for me to actually consider writing about drink because you, you didn't really think about people writing about beer for a living, and here is this guy kind of travelling around the world drinking beer. Uh-huh. I think, hey, oh, hang on, that's a job, <laughs> uh, and I got a job on Off Licence News, which is a drink trade weekly, and. It was around about the time where Her Garden wheat beer suddenly became a cult beer in the UK. I mean, wheat bread had it or something. So wheat beer began to come into the UK. So I decided to do a wheat beer tasting. And I knew, obviously, bugger all about beer. Uh, and I thought, maybe I could ask Michael Jackson. You know, and it was just kind of <laughs> madness, you know, you, you know, you know, you know, asking a superstar to come along to, to, to a tasting. And he came along and he was just... Michael, you know, he was just wonderful and humble and funny and erudite and fascinating. And yeah, I mean, that, that, that was the first time I met him. We kind of stayed in touch. Then I got a job on uh, Whiskey Magazine. Uh, so I, I came in as a columnist in Whiskey Magazine. And at that point, we, we really began to, you know, I'd met him at various other tastings before that. But it was really when, when I started with Whiskey Magazine that we... We, we saw a huge amount of each other and travelled the world together and, you know, tasted it together, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it kind that, of kicked off then. D- does that put it around the early 90s, the mid-90s? Yeah, yeah, mid to late 90s, yeah. Okay, yeah, was it 95 yeah. or 96 was the beginning of Whiskey Magazine? Uh, good question, yeah. I, Pro- probably, I was in Aber- yeah, it would be 96, because... Uh, I was I went freelance ninety five yeah I'd be ninety six yeah okay yeah yeah which <laughs> it's so funny because I remember the exact flat I was living in in Aberdeen when my buddy Petty and I started subscribing to Whiskey Magazine right. and I remember it coming through the letterbox in a plastic wrap no brown wrapping just clear plastic wrap and and I was just thinking like. Holy shit! There's a magazine 
dedicated to whiskey, this thing that we're just starting to get into. And mm-hmm. there was Michael Jackson in there yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. Ah, it doesn't seem that long was, ago. Was that... Uh, so, Jason, I apologize. So, was Michael Jackson being in Whiskey Magazine the first, your first you know, hearing of his existence, or was it the third? It would have been the third edition of The Companion. It would have been the third yeah. edition. Yeah, okay. because I remember okay. us having that hard copy. And I, I want to yeah. say the first edition of The Companion was 89, mm. which is the same year Beer Hunter was on in the United yeah. States. It came yeah. on Discovery yeah. in the United States. And actually, you know, Joshua and I famously do no preparation for any of our interviews. Last night... I watched the first episode of Beer Hunter, which is Michael Jackson with Fritz Maytag talking about Anchor Steam uh, in San Francisco. Uh And and they go on this 300-mile bus journey to to see the field where the barley's being harvested for the Christmas edition of of the the, the Anchor uh, brew. And... And what's really, and this is why I'm asking you so much about the dates here, Dave, is for that to be 89, Michael Jackson was born in 1942. So he was 47 for Beer Hunter. I'm 47 in a couple of months. And, you know, when you grow up and you're thinking, oh, there's Michael Jackson. He's always that old guy that I think of who was into whiskey, who was, you know, generations before me, or maybe a generation before me. And then I think, oh, shit, this project where he was on TV doing what you just said a moment ago, touring the world, doing beer, same bloody age. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Jason, okay, time a, to step it up a gear. Yeah, yeah. He was a young man. <laughs> <laughs> His whole life was ahead of him, Dave. <laughs> yeah. uh, so so, so that's, that is part of what I wanted to ask you. You were hmm. alluding to this a moment ago. Where did you think your career was going and how much of a turn did you make with your own career when you saw Michael doing beer and then, of course, Michael doing whiskey? Yeah, I mean, it was that opening up of the possibility of, of writing, about, writing about drink. Obviously, there was plenty of wine, wine writing going on, you know, and I was, working, I was working in a shop, I ran a pub, so I suppose they did know a little bit about beer. Uh, but you know the real, the only opportunity you had for writing about drink, certainly in the UK, was through wine journalism. Uh, and there was there's a lot of very good wine writers in, in in the UK. So when I went freelance, it was kind of, well, what do I do? You know, how do I specialise? Where, where's my niche going to be? Because you know I'm not going to take on Jancis Robinson or you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? insert uh, large it, wine name here. Yeah. Uh, and it was really only the, the, the fact that I had Michael's books and I was interested in whiskey and he kind of opened up the field. He showed that it was possible and he showed that it was it was a valid subject to write about. You know, nobody really wanted mm-hmm. to write about spirits. Spirits was really looked down on uh, in terms of writing, I would say, until... <laughs> Until Michael came along, you know, it was That's crazy. I, I, to think it, about. it was yeah, it's a weird one. It was kind That's of you, you were allowed yeah. to write about cognac because it was made from wine, you know. So cognac was kind of okay, but everything else was tainted with commerciality. You know, it was trade. Oh, interesting. Uh, so it's a purity you know, thing. There was a purity thing about it, and also with beer. You know, you know, if it wasn't for Michael, well, I mean, we can talk in maybe down the line about his influence in, in the beer world, but it was just this. There are amazing stories out there, and I'm finding these amazing stories, and it is a valid subject to, to write about. So he showed the possibility, which I then grasped, and and he was incredibly generous and magnanimous. You know the fact that you know somebody else was coming into to the field, and you know, there was really only two other people writing about whiskey at, at that particular time. Uh, yeah. But you know he was you know he couldn't have been more open and, and more. More happy to, to share share information, share knowledge. So, yeah. huh. I've got another question along this line, and then I'll I'll let Joshua get a word in. I was <laughs> I was always impressed by Michael's way of of being positive, and mm. and reading through the companion. And yes, it was scores out of a hundred, but you know. I, I went through it one time and I don't quite remember the number, but I want to say maybe the worst score is a 
68 maybe I, I, I can't quite remember but it's certainly not a you know a 15 or anything like that but I, I remember reading something where Michael from Michael where he'd said there's always something positive to say and when I'd started working on on my blog I, I carried that with me and I would always turn you know some rank note would be burning tires or screeching tires or there, there would be a way to tell that story in knowing him and spending time with him what, what was that kind of guiding ethos for him with, with the industry? Especially now you're starting to put some leaves on the branches here about there was a sense of commercialism with non-wine where anything you said or wrote could be seen as an advertisement for, for that, that product. What was Michael's take there on presenting this fairly to an audience? Well, he was, he was a journalist, you know, I mean, he would always say, you know, when we were, you know, talking about writing or whatever, he would always sort of say, remember, Dave, you know, we're just hacks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know we're, we're, we're here, we're doing a gig, right, we're doing a gig, and it's a gig that we love, but we're doing a gig, and our job is, and it's something I, I, I still fervently believe in, our job is to get the story and present the story in the best way possible to people mm. and not get in the way and, and get, not put ourselves in between the story mm. and the reader you know we, we are mm. here uh, I, 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 allowing that story to flow uh, and I think that then which is kind of an, answering your question I think it meant that he lo always looked at whiskey from a wider industry point of view, from a category point of view, as something which deserved to be promoted and understood and celebrated. Uh, so mm. I, he was very rarely ever, I, I never heard him ever being negative about whiskey, you know, uh, about even kind of controversial things. He, he would perhaps steer away from that. He always wanted to find, as you said, the positive uh, in, in things because... Especially at a time, and I, I, you see, we tend to forget this. You know, this is nineteen nineties uh, into the beginning of, of of this century. We forget how small the whiskey world was in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wasn't the fact that there were one hundred and forty distilleries in Scotland and every country in the world was making whiskey. It was a small industry at, at that particular mm -hmm. point. Single malt was a new thing. Single malt really only started mm -hmm. get going in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. So it was really important from a writing point of view not to kind of shoot it down at that early stage. You know, even if there were missteps by the industry, it would be completely counterproductive when you're actually trying to build knowledge, build your knowledge, but actually disseminate this information and enthuse people about this, this mm -hmm. new product to actually be negative about it. Uh, the negative came later. Once everything was established, then you had... Uh, uh, the, 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 then you had cynical bloggers coming in thinking they knew everything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, was, there, was there a fine line to be drawn there between being a champion of the industry and being uh, a potential shill of the industry? Was, it, was there a known fine line there or was it just, look, we're, we're passionate, we're enthusiastic, there's... There's stories to be told. Was there a, a level of awareness there, or is that just yeah. more of a? Because I know where things have gone, I might be more cynical in thinking no. about how things were per perceived before they really took off. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're always there's always this grey. It's always this grey area. There's it's always this line. You know, you know, and I think everybody has their own personal line. You know, how far do you want to push it? You know, how far do you want to step over and do some promotional work for brands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, as Alfred Barnard did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah you know. writing pamphlets, right? Because he was a hack, you know. So, mm. so yeah, so, so, so undoubtedly, uh, there was, uh, he did it, I did it, all of my colleagues, I, did, I think I've done it, I've done, you know, off you know, behind the scenes promotional work or writing copy or tasting or, or whatever, but never standing up there and being the brand ambassador, mm. you know. Uh, and, and he never crossed that line. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, because some people mm -hmm. will do that. Uh, but he always kind of pushed it as far. And, and again, I, I think in retrospect, this is something I learned from him. You know, that you can you can stand up and talk about a whiskey, but not represent that whiskey. So you can always put that whiskey within 
the context of the industry. And I always think about that wider picture. And I think that from a, a journalistic point of view, it is what he brought to it. You know, he always saw that bigger picture rather than the very narrow focus, which somebody from the brand would do. So if he was talking about McAllen, for example, it wouldn't just be McAllen, it would be that contextual mm. uh, world mm -hmm. that surrounds McAllen yeah. that he mm -hmm. was as interested in as the liquid himself, because the distiller could talk about that. He could talk about something else. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th th that was a huge learning for me as well. Am I allowed to talk now, Jason? Th this is me purposely not asking a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 this is a rare occurrence, you know, make the most of it. <laughs> it is, oh, it I, is. I have three, don't worry about that part, but this is me. <laughs> My first recollection of just finding out who Mike, who, of who Michael Jackson was, was before I was into whiskey. It was before I was even, not that I've ever been serious about beer. I don't think I've ever been serious about beer. I've always enjoyed beer and, and, and of course, wanted to try new things and new styles and microbrews and, and so on and so forth. But it was from being a, a fan of the Conan O'Brien show. And I remember it was either in the, the late 90s or the early 2000s. I don't remember the time frame, but I remember him getting on there. And I said, wow, th this guy's a character. And he seemed both aloof and knowing what was going on around him at all times at the same time. <laughs> and, and, Cone, and it seemed if – it's been a while since I've seen the clip, but if I remember – correctly you know it seemed conan o'brien was trying to do a shtick trying mm -hmm. to do his funny man stuff mm -hmm. meanwhile michael jackson was doing his thing and the two never really met they didn't you know bash heads or anything but it was it was clear it was this it was this conversation that didn't really sync up but it stuck with me because i just thought he was such a character and and i felt that in his own way whether he knew it or not, because again, I didn't know the guy, whether he knew it or not, he was giving Conan a run for his money. Okay. He was making Conan work for his paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm curious as to what was Michael Jackson like? Like, is, is that just how he was? Was he putting on a persona? Like, w did people get to see the real Michael Jackson when he was on television, or was he a bit different? No, no, no. You know, what, what you got, what, what you saw was what you got. Uh, yeah. No, he, he was he was incredibly funny, but he, he had you know a very very dry Yorkshire, uh, slightly <laughs> lugubrious sense of humour. Once you got his sense of humour, you, you would know uh, how funny he was. And there was a, there was a constant little asides that, that there were. Lots of kind of looks o o over the glasses sounding, you know, you know, you know, uh -huh. you know, you know uh -huh. I, I, are you getting that? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the little kind of quiet side, little, little raises, raising of eyebrows. Uh, so yeah, he, he was an immensely amusing uh, man. Yeah, yeah, he, the, the, there was no artifice about him at all. It wasn't kind of, all right, Michael Jackson is now here kind of thing, folks. It was, you know, <laughs> this is Michael. This is what Michael is like. And it was, uh, it was kind of hilarious to be around. And there, there was a shambolic nature to him, you know, of, you know, missing trains and, you know, making sure he was in time and, you know, losing items of clothing and, you know, <laughs> all of that, you know, kind of, kind of absent-minded <laughs> professor element yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, about yeah. it. At the same time being incredibly driven and knowing, knowing when his deadline was in which he'd missed by two weeks but you know knowing when his deadline was <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah so it's, it's all these these two areas but yeah yeah he, he was an absolute he was a delight to be he was, he was a delight delightful companion uh but yeah absolutely yeah no no artifice about him at all yeah i, th I think you, i think you really nailed it with the absent-minded professor <laughs> Uh, kind of feel because that that's what I got. The the only difference is, and, and again, I'm I'm going by memory, but I got this feeling like he he knew he knew what he was doing. Like oh, yeah. he, I didn't feel he was putting on an act, but he was he was being himself, and it was clear that Conan was just just trying to figure him out, and and it was just a, it was a joy to watch, and and I. I hadn't thought again, like Jason had said, we don't do any research, and and 
you know, I was just thinking about it last night, and but I didn't watch it. Now we need to go back and yeah, watch it and see. There, if there's it's actually true. two different Conan appearances, oh, there? and um, there's yeah. the, the the first one is a is a little more buttoned up, where it it felt like everyone was on their best behavior with one another, and then the next one, I I felt like. Conan was trying to do a bit more and, and, and you yeah. know, uh, the trouble that I sometimes run into is when I'm with a funny person, I, you know, I'm not a particularly funny person, and I, I try to just stay straight and stay myself and let them be funny. You don't try and meet them. And, and kind of in one of the appearances, mm. you know, the joke is really just, here's a, a dude who drinks beer all day. Like, could you imagine this type of lifestyle? And it, it just seemed like the easiest hit, right? It, yeah, it was the yeah, easiest yeah, humor, yeah. Um, which I don't think there was much to rise to. It'd be like saying, "Oh, his, he's called Michael Jackson," right? <laughs> there's, there's not much there. <laughs> and one of the things I wanted to ask you, Dave, is, you know, it, in in reading some of his obituaries, they actually draw upon him kind of taking ownership of that. And there's a TV appearance he made. It might have been in, in Beer Hunter, where he addresses the camera in one white glove and <laughs> and addresses the fact that he's Michael Jackson. <laughs> like, like as you went around the world together, did did he did he own it? Did he just there was no other way to address it? Yeah, exactly. You know, he he he, he owned it. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I can imagine him on, on on the Conan show being asked that you know, oh, here's a guy who gets paid. You know, you know, paid to drink and blah blah blah. You know, I've heard that a million times in in various interviews. And you know, you do raise your eyebrow and get okay, right? You know, just you know, let's get this over and actually get to the meat of the thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm probably more. I'm probably less patient than he he was. You know. Mm. <laughs> uh, Interesting. Peek behind the Dave Broom curtain. I like <laughs> <laughs> Huddersfield versus Glasgow. You know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there something about Michael Jackson that that you came to know, came to be familiar with and, and fond of that maybe some people might not know about him that you'd be able to share? Yeah, in in, in, in terms of in terms of the writing, I, I I think what people what people expected from Michael. Because yeah. of all of the books, because of the TV appearances, because he was Michael Jackson, uh, I think the and even distillers kind of thought that you know he he wouldn't be interested, you know that, that he'd seen it all that that after a certain point he he was he could just kind of walk through life because he'd absorbed all the knowledge and you know it was it was gravy for, from now on. But I remember going to Long Morn with him. Uh, and he was there uh, with his notebook out and writing down and asking questions and blah blah blah. And, and the then distillery manager went, "But Michael, you've been round here before." He went, "Yeah, I've been around. The, I've been around a few times." And he went, and he, he was, you know, quite genuinely said, "But you know, why are you why are you taking notes?" He was kind of have, have you forgot kind of saying, "Have you forgotten everything I told you?" And he went, "No, because every time you come round, it's something new, mm. you know, and." That's what, and I, I think that is what people didn't realise uh, about Michael, that he was constantly looking out for something new. He was constantly enthused about the subject, about whether that was beer or whiskey or jazz or rugby league or, or whatever. He was constantly fascinated by it. So he wasn't kind of falling back on, well, I've done that and I'll, I'll just kind of, you know, cut and paste it. I know a bit of writing and, and that'll do. He he had that that wonderful thing about kind of being on the edge of innocence, <laughs> like, you know, you know where yeah. you know the, this glass that you have in front of you. It's the first time you've tasted that whiskey, and wow, this is amazing. This is exciting. This is new. And even if you've been to a distillery before, or 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 met a person before, and interviewed them before, this meeting is going to be different. So that for me, just keeping things fresh, keeping things alive. Uh, that was probably a side of him that people didn't didn't see and didn't realise because they hadn't really mm -hmm. witnessed it. You know, they just kind of, kind of mm -hmm. assumed that he drifted through life. 
<laughs> you know, once he'd written a few books, boom, that was it. Job, job done. And it was, it was, it was not that. You know, he never, he never stopped working. He never stopped writing. He was always looking out for the next gig, the next story. You know, he was a hack. He was a journalist. He he wanted to know, the, uh, you know, exactly what what was going on. So so yeah, yeah. Maybe that maybe that's something forgotten uh, or hmm. you know misunderstood. I think what's interesting is you're talking about his writing there and in first approaching the companion when I knew nothing, I felt like it was very welcoming and very accessible. And as I continued to read it and drink and learn more, I always found there was more to to tease out of the companion. And even now, you know, and, and I did it literally two weeks ago, writing tasting notes for a cask we've selected from a distillery that we haven't picked from before. I'm going back into the companion. I'm looking at what Michael was saying about that distillery. I'm looking how, at what he described as the house style mm. of that distillery. Mm. And and I again, as I mentioned earlier about having them behind me, right? Even opening up that companion in 2021, Michael Jackson continues to stand behind me as I continue on the journey. And I, and I think that speaks volumes to his writing and to his, his personality or maybe his professionalism. But that way to still have information that you can still glean years and years after publication. Yeah. And, 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 a, and, a, yeah. and a great writer. You know, yeah, I, I think the, oh, other yes. thing, the, you know, the other thing that this almost kind of overlooked, you know, is he was an amazingly good writer. He was a beautiful, beautiful writer, uh, and he made it seem very easy, you know. Uh, you know and as he good continued, writers do, yeah. And he continued to write amazing, you know, especially in his later years. You know, I, I got kind of fairly obsessed with his kind of Michael Jackson's late style, uh, <laughs> and he he wrote a whole series of of articles for Slow Food. He was quite involved in the Slow Food movement. Mm. Uh, so he wrote a whole number of articles for Slow Food magazine, which only ever appeared in Italian, and occasionally in English. There's one or two in English. And they were, they were probably his most personal. Uh, you, know, you, you didn't learn the huge amount of Michael from his, from his writing. You know, it was, he, was, he was a journalist, you know. Uh, but yeah. the, these were probably the, the most personal uh, things that he wrote about, about growing up or about, you know, his dis description of, you know, what it was like standing outside the pub waiting for his dad to come out of the pub and smells, etc., etc. Uh, and he kind of opened up a, a, a little bit in terms of in terms of the, those stories towards the, the end of his life. And the quality of the writing, just awesome, absolutely awesome. You know, so as a stylist, uh, he, he, you know, he, anybody who... And I'm delighted that you say that you you find that find the work still relevant. But I I would say you know anybody anybody out there who is interested in starting writing about whiskey, and looking at Michael Jackson's books and then looking at publication date and going, ah, it's it's an old book. <laughs> you know what am I going to learn? You're going to learn. You're going to learn a huge amount. You're going to learn a huge amount about how how to construct a sentence. How mm. you don't have to copy him, but just look at how. Look at how that information is amassed and put down on the page, and the, the beauty of the language. Uh, so you can learn a people should still be reading them for that reason alone. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. D definitely that reason, and then another reason for me in in getting into to whiskey. You know, what autumn of ninety six, and knowing that here you've got this chap who'd been publishing a malt whiskey companion for seven years before I started my journey. And it's, yes, it's still relevant. It's also wonderfully historical. Hmm. And so you, you get, and, and contextual, which we've delved into uh, a fair few times in our chats. Um, but, but also having that context served. And that, to me, makes the connection with someone you mentioned way earlier, Alfred Barnard, where we can then go back yeah. a century and get the context with Barnard and, and his journey through whiskey. So, yeah, I, I love the fact that, that Michael has his place within that pantheon, which 
leads me to a, a serious question. Then I've got a silly question, and I don't know. Maybe Joshua wants to come back into the conversation oh. at some point Hi, as Josh. well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, hey. Good, good to see you. <laughs> I'm glad I'm still noticed here. That's that's, that's good. <laughs> so you, you you talked earlier about not wanting Michael not wanting to come between the the subject and the person, and clearly he was Michael Jackson. Clearly, he could walk into a room and be Michael Jackson. Clearly, we're talking with you today about Michael Jackson for a One Nation Under Whiskey about Michael Jackson. He was clearly a, a massive, massive figure in whiskey. How did he grapple with being this huge figure within the industry that he was also writing about? Uh, he he found it. I, I, I'm thinking in terms of uh, going to shows with him, like like going to Whiskey Live Japan, for example. We went to Japan a lot together, uh, where he was like revered, you know, and you know, the crowds of people, you know, queuing up to get his autograph, to shake his hand after photograph taken with him, uh, and he spent time with them. He would always spend time with people. You know, somebody came up to, to ask a question, pluck up the courage to ask a question. <laughs> he would spend time with them. So there was there was no airs and graces. So he wasn't walking into the room going, hello, you know, I'm Michael Jackson. And, you know, having having minders kind of going, uh, Mr. Jackson, yeah. we'll see you now kind of thing. You know, there was none of that. It was just, it, it was still that kind of element of amusement, you know. Yeah, cause I, yeah, I would walk past and he would be surrounded by, you know, yeah. surrounded by people and he would kind of look at me and just kind of, Smirk, <laughs> you, know, you know, because you know at the heart of it, that there was he loved it, you know, he loved it, but it was never kind of this egotistical thing. There was always a mm. an element of wry amusement that that people would even bother, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I'm delighted to sell books. I'm delighted that that, that you're interested. In it. I'm flattered that you're interested in it. But at the same time, this is all a bit ridiculous. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, so so the, 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 there was a lot of that uh, in Michael as well. You know, just seeing seeing the inherent absurdity of the situation. Uh, Wonderful. That you know. You know, why are you talking to me? You should be over there drinking the whiskey. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I did have one thought, Jason. Actually, you you brought it up. <laughs> the fact that that these books will remain historical, right? If you if you just go back to when he started writing it, I can think of two distilleries off the top of my head that have changed their house styles since he started writing. You've got Glen Geary that doesn't peat anymore. You've got Ardmore that switched from direct fire to you know, direct fire stills from direct fire stills, I should say. And, and so it'll be really interesting as, as the years go on to see how that book fits and, and remains mm. within a historical context. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I, mean, I, I just, I sincerely hope that they're all still in print and all these old ones are still there. I, I looked at one earlier on, that, which I've, I've now, well, well, here it is, uh, Scotland and its whiskies, which, which is one of his one of his later ones, uh, which came is out. Is that mostly a pictorial, Dave? Yeah, it was lots of nice photos in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so two thousand and one, and it's it's you know it, it is a journey through through Scotland. So it's a wonderful kind of narrative uh, about Scotland as well. Yeah, and lots of good good photos in it, but a really really good book. Kind of kind of slightly. Slightly overlooked and ignored, but as a mm -hmm. historical document, uh, this one this one's a really interesting one as well. So it, rather than just being, you know, the companion with which great great tasting guide and you know kind of hardcore information, that that's a little bit more lyrical, a bit more laid back, and it, it tells you a hell of a lot about about what Scotland was like, you know, mm -hmm. you know what two decades ago, and it's some of it's unrecognisable, whiskey wise. So yeah. Buy the books. Buy the books. Do you have another Joshua? I could. You know, I've got one. I will. I will. I of course, and I always, I always pull back. And I'll, I'll let you <laughs> take the helm once again. So, Dave, with 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 the interest of time, we'll we'll get out of here on this. Is there the one Michael Jackson story that you you pull out at parties? You pull out at <laughs> gatherings. The the one that really 
encapsulates your time with him, your travels with him, your relationship with him. Um, I, I know it's it's hard to to sum it up into one, but is there is there a crowd pleaser that you always pull out? Is there a crowd pleaser? Uh, I'm thinking of oh god, uh, yeah, there was. <laughs> <laughs> there was one night, yeah. There was there was a couple. Sorry, I I, I can't just have one. There's there's going to be a couple. Uh, there was our first trip to Japan together, uh, where he got on. Uh, I was carrying his bag full of books because he always he always <laughs> brought books with him because he never trusted his publisher to send enough books out. So he always had bags of books. Uh, and we, we were in premium economy, and Michael. Uh, somehow managed to charm the stewardess by by saying he had to finish some work, which he probably did have to do, uh, to get to get himself upgraded to business class <laughs> while on the flight, which is impossible to do normally. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of left there and he swans off up to business class because he can plug his computer in and actually just drink champagne. Uh, and, you know, that evening when we were in Kyoto uh, and... We're in this little bar called Hori's Bar, which is this really bizarre homage to to, to Scottish bars. It was nothing like any Scottish bar you've ever seen in your life. Uh, you have lots of stag's heads and Glaswegian country and western and stuff. And I, I was sitting next to, in between a geisha and the former uh, uh, Japanese ambassador to Belgium. And Michael had a, a, a geisha and was sitting next to, I forget, I think it was one of the blenders from Suntory. And it was just the most absurd night. And I remember him leaning over and kind of going, welcome to Japan, Dave. <laughs> you know, this, this absurdity that was going on. There's another one in, uh, where he, he decided he, he, he wanted to go to this bar in Tokyo. And, I mean, if you've ever tried to get to a bar in Tokyo, it's really hard if you don't have the address. And he only knew vaguely where it was. <laughs> but we headed out, you know, you're full of hope and optimism. Yeah, we, we, we never found the bar, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> you know, it was just like this strange, strange journey through through Tokyo and we just kind of went, well, there's one there. I, oh, yeah, there's nice beer in there and you know, off, off, off we went. And uh, yeah, That's it's, uh, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was full of these kind of strange little incidents that, uh, yeah. Catalogue of disasters. Uh, yeah, it was a kind of catalogue <laughs> yeah. of disasters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, th- thank you so much, Dave. It's mm. just such a pleasure to spend time with you and, and reminisce about somebody we never had the good fortune to meet. Well, it's an absolute treat uh, talking about a dear friend, you know. So, so yeah. Thank you for asking me on. Cheers. Hans, Carol, thank you both so much for joining us. It, it, Carol, just so you're aware, I reached out to Hans, I think it was over the weekend or maybe it was last Friday, with this, you know, sort of last minute request, you know, us trying to put this episode together to talk about Michael Jackson. And I, I think having the conversation without Hans, given how close they were, would be um, an incomplete conversation. And then it was Hans that said, I think this conversation would be incomplete without Carol because she, she was his partner and she would be able to talk about the, you know, his passion for beer as well. And so it really, you know, I'm so happy that you could take the time to, to talk with us and share some of your insights into, into Michael. So thank you for, for coming. We really appreciate that. Thank you for having me. So I was just yeah. uh, I was just uh, very egotistical from me, Carol. I just wanted to see you again. It's been so long, so long ago. <laughs> 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 it's so nice to see you. And when mm. Becky popped in, that was wonderful. I miss you too. Well, likewise, we'd love to see you again in in real life. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to do that soon. Hans, part part of the reason why we wanted to have you on, as, as Jason and I were thinking of how to put this this podcast episode together, I went back to our conversation from is it three years ago now, maybe four years ago, where we were at Maltstock, and I was interviewing you for the podcast, and it was very clear that in your writing, 
know, very, very early on, there was a, a very tight, close connection between you and, and uh, the late Michael Jackson. And so I wonder if you could share with our listeners some of your earlier recollections of you being in touch with Michael and then starting to collaborate with Michael. Yeah, I can do that. Um, well, when I started to become interested in whiskey, which was in the late, in the mid to late seventies, there was hardly any, any literature I could use. So I had to find, find out a lot of things myself and Luckily, then, uh, in the late 80s, uh, two books appeared on the market. Uh, um, Michael's big whiskey book um, and uh, mm-hmm. Companion. And they were kind of a uh, you know, staple for me to learn more about how to describe flavors and aromas and understand more about malt whiskey. I was not that interested in his beer side, although I like beer. I don't write about beer. Um, so I started to investigate and find out how to get in touch with him. And that was very difficult. That was <laughs> very difficult. He had a, a personal assistant. Uh, uh, his name is, shall not be mentioned, a very nice guy. But he he, he guarded Michael uh, like Cerberus would guard uh, the underworld <laughs> in the Greek mythology. So I, I couldn't go past him. He wouldn't let me. And for many years, I tried and tried didn't work um, until my Dutch publisher, that was late 90s, early 2000s, said, Hans, I've bought the rights of two whiskey books from uh, a certain Michael Jackson. He didn't really know who he was. And would you like to translate them? I said, I'd love to, but I have to get in touch with him because I know a lot of his work is is, uh, connected to his experiences in another country. And I'll give you an example. Mm. Uh, if you talk about, Michael would talk about mint humbugs and things like that. These are candies we don't know in the Netherlands. So I needed to talk with him and find equivalents uh, in the Netherlands so people would understand and connect. And one of the best ways to to get in touch with someone and learn a little bit about he or she thinks is discussing a book that you have to translate. So. Then we got mm-hmm. in touch and immediately we, we were on, on a very good speaking terms because we found out we both had started at a local publishing company, at a local newspaper, had done proofreading, editing, and then ventured into the uh, world of writing articles and books. He was 15 years my senior. Mm-hmm. I'm 65 now and he sadly died when he was 65. So that's again 15 mm-hmm. years ago. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. But... When we understood that, he uh, he and I immediately connected. And for us, it was far more to talk about than just whiskey because we both love to write. We also have a kind of humor that connected. So uh, quickly, we it grew into a, a warm friendship and we would cooperate on other levels as well. Michael would ask me to, if he ran out of time, which often happened with him, he would ask if I could write a little column for a German magazine. In English, of course, and then Mm. I would send, he would give me the bones. I would write a little story for him, send it to him. He would Jacksonize it and then send it off to the German uh, (laughs) publisher. So we got well into understanding each other's writing. Can I put. Can I pause you right there really quickly? I, I loved what you just said. He Jacksonized it. Can you, (laughs) can we tease that out a little bit? What, what, what is him Jacksonizing it? Well, I think uh, Michael was, and I think still is, if you compare it with, with uh, contemporary writers and writers who are uh, now uh, new writers who come to the fore. He, was, he, was, he had a literary approach um, mm. that's shown through all his writing. I'm, maybe Carol can later on elaborate on the, on the beer writing because I'm not too familiar with it in detail. But it, <laughs> I had written a couple of novels. So one of my novels was in the in the late nineties. It was also uh, published in English. So I sent him a copy, mm-hmm. and this is typical Michael. He read the book. He said, "Hans, I enjoy it, but what's the plot?" So I was <laughs> such a little guy again. <laughs> <laughs> we, I also, I also remember uh, we would uh, discuss certain um, expressions. Like, 
I would call Michael and say, Michael, um, is whiskey, uh, from a language perspective, uh, is it feminine or masculine? He said, why do you want to know, Hans? Mm. I said, well, one of your tasting notes, you describe our bag as he, and in another tasting note, Dolwini as she. He said, well, you picked mm. that out. So what are we going to do? After half an hour, we decided that whiskey would be masculine and distillery would be feminine. Again, from a language perspective. Oh. So this... Huh. This is the uh, amount of detail we would put into uh, the translation. Um, I'm, I'll do a quick detour to to Dave. I also translated Dave's whiskey atlas. Um, I had the same mm -hmm. many many years later, and I had the same uh, type of questions. And uh, Dave was difficult to get hold on by telephone, so we would usually do that via email. So I had something I really needed to localize in the Dutch edition. So I gave him uh, the example, I said, how do you want me to solve it? Uh, upon which Dave, being Dave, only answered, smartly, Hans. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, and then, uh, well, Michael uh, got acquainted with Becky and the two of them loved each other at first sight at a, as, as a a father or an uncle would love his his, his niece or, or daughter. Um, mm. Especially when Michael had a difficult period when he was in Leiden, uh, in, I think it was 2005 or six, and uh, well, the, f the first uh, effects of his, of his illness came through and people still thought he was yeah. inebriated. Uh, at one time, mm. his sugars mm. were totally off and Becky noticed she got hold of two sturdy guys and they helped him to his hotel room and she stayed with him throughout uh, the day and evening because I had to work at the festival. And she really pulled him through and he never forgot when he wrote the foreword for A Taste of Whiskey. Uh, he mentioned especially how Becky had taken care of him on the road. Uh, so then yeah. with Carol and Becky both being nice. American ladies, that was, a, was an extra special <laughs> connection. Yeah. Yes. Michael talked about Becky and how she took care of him at that time. He felt very special feelings toward her because she was such a caring person. She is, and I benefit from that every day, Carol. Well, every day. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know you're a lucky man. <laughs> but you're a close second, you know, you're in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys, just laugh. <laughs> 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 uh, but well, that is a little bit about Jacksonizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So could continue on with that that kind of burgeoning relationship that the two of you had there, as you were, you know, first of all, difficulty contacting him, and then once contact was made, the things you had in common. Mm. What was it like when the two of you got to hang out at festivals together? What, you know, you're talking about 15 years of age difference, but was it kind of brotherly kind of relationship? Would you? knock on each other or, or what did that well, look like first first he was my mentor and then he became a very dear friend but for me he was a i have a brother who's 16 years younger and he was for me that that older oh, okay. that older older brotherhood who would make fun with me and fun of me when i got too serious uh, we also spent time on the road <laughs> away from the festivals and he would <laughs> we would stay in, in, in hotels together and prepare, doing uh, uh, writing tasting notes together, but also enjoying uh, talking about history, about the publishing world, and that the publishers are the ones who earn the money and the, the authors only get 10 cents a copy. He once told me, he said, Hans, mm -hmm. according to Dorling Kindersley, I've sold 800,000 copies of the Malt Whiskey Companion. Now, I get 70p, I can tell it now because uh, the contracts are not valid anymore. He said, so I I did the math and I should have been a millionaire, but I'm far from, from a millionaire. Why are, they <laughs> <laughs> why are they doing that? I said, well, you know, uh, publishers always lie about uh, the amount of books are, that are being printed. They're much higher in the public eye than they are wow. on the royalty uh, statement for the author. There are good publishers mm -hmm. too. I, I, mm -hmm. Let me tell that I, I have a couple of very <laughs> good publishers. 
<laughs> wow. So, so that, that was just common practice that, that he was then wrestling with. Yeah, yeah. And, well, so am I. That's why I, uh, I publish uh, part of my books myself, because I, I can control the whole, especially with print-on-demand books, I can control the whole value chain. And Becky and I make far more money than when we would have done that via uh, traditional publishers. Although I also work with them because there are books that c cannot be uh, uh, published in print on demand. For instance, my book on whiskey and jazz. And that was also something that uh, uh, Michael and I had common ground. I was toying with the idea for some years to write a book about whiskey and music. And I wasn't sure which direction it should go. And I'm once... I told Michael, I said, I don't know where to start. He said, I'll give you a start. And he told me a story about Dexter Gordon uh, using Lagavulin for a smoky martini. I said, then we have to do jazz. Mm. Yes, he said, do jazz of the bebop kind, because that's the one we <laughs> like both. <laughs> so he really was um, a very uh, stimulating person in uh, getting me to write about whiskey and jazz. And, uh, Dave, who also likes jazz, immediately uh, was happy uh, to write the foreword for, for Whiskey and Jazz. And he wrote in the foreword, he found uh, an album uh, which is called Take a Jackson in Your House. The album, we talk about LP, long play record. Um, yeah. So he wrote at the end of his foreword, uh, <laughs> take, a, take, take a Jackson in Your House and Take an Offering Gaat Too. <laughs> uh, did, did either of you enjoy the album Take a Jackson in Your House? I've never I've never heard it. I, I've never <laughs> been able to pick up a copy, but this was this was Dave in his foreword and I was well, he wrote the foreword, but what else would I, would I say? Uh, but since we liked uh, jazz so much, uh, Michael and I I have my favorite pub here in Zola. Uh, it's it's very old and it's built in the in the in the city wall. And the publican at the time he he passed away a year later uh, than uh, Michael. The publican uh, he loved jazz too, and he was uh, uh, he was he wanted to see Michael one time because he liked beer and he had a beautiful collection of whiskey. So he asked me one of the festivals in the Netherlands. He said, afterward, can't you convince Michael to come with you to Zwolle and that he can do a tasting in the pub? <laughs> so I called Michael. I said, just take a couple of more days. I know a little, beautiful little uh, hotel here, not too far from here. And we can crash there together with Becky and have some fun. And our former queen, Juliana, used to stay there. So that's kind of a... It was far more run down than the three of us stayed there, but it was famous for uh, that time. So um, that evening we went to the pub and I knew Theo, the publican, and uh, Michael. If they would see each other, they would start talking about jazz. So we walked in mm -hmm. and there was Art Tatum on the player and they looked at each other and they sat down and they started to talk, talk, talk. and. Well, the hour that the people would arrive for the tasting uh, was nearing. So I said, shall we prepare? And Michael said, Hans, you do the tasting. I'll talk jazz tonight with Theo. <laughs> of course, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, they loved each other's company. Yeah, They immediately bonded. And I was happy to be the liaison officer in this particular event because Theo was older than I, too, uh, s closer to age uh, to, to Michael than me. And Theo and I had done mm. many, many things in uh, in his pub about music. We once threw an after party for Status Quo when they had uh, when they ah. had played in Zwolle. Uh, Jeff Hotel played here, and he was always there to offer. But the, the nicest thing we did, because Michael was coming, I said, "Well, uh, we will invite uh, the people who are the frequent visitors of the pub and like whiskey, because they all wanted to meet Michael." Mm. The big book was out in Dutch, so they could sign it. And I sent uh, uh, a short letter to uh, to the local newspaper where I used to work for many, many years ago. I said, well, if you're interested, uh, Michael Jackson uh, will be in town. Uh, you can get an invitation, and, but you have to come to the Tagrijn. And they didn't believe me. 
they thought it was the other Michael Jackson. <laughs> so <laughs> no one showed up. Jesus. I had somebody else lined up from a from a tiny, you know, these these newspapers that go door to door. You don't have to pay any subscription. It's all full with little local ads. So uh-huh. I, had, I had I had also phoned that guy. I said, "Come over. This is really special. He's the he's the beer and uh, and and whiskey writer of the twentieth century and part of the twenty first. So he showed up with a photographer, and the next day in his little little newspaper, instead of the big one, it was Michael Jackson in Zola. So <laughs> <laughs> then I got the chief editor of the big newspaper. Said Hans, you used to work for us. Why didn't you uh, inform us? He said I did. <laughs> Silence. Oh yeah. my! Michael Jackson is wallet. They still talk about it. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful! Gosh, that's wonderful. Fantastic. Oh, and in terms of that type of meeting and in terms of that personality, what was your experience, Carol? Uh, I'm curious on the beer side how the the two of you made acquaintance, you and Michael. Ah, well, I was a beer writer. I had started mm-hmm. writing about beer. Actually, I was. Um, Trying to sort of find my way, I decided I was going to write a beer cookbook, Cooking with Beer. And so one thing led to another, and I ended up writing at Bella Online, the voice of women on the Internet. And so while I was doing that, I saw that Michael Jackson was doing a tasting, a beer Mm -hmm. tasting, at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. So Mm -hmm. I asked to be there as a journalist and the first year I only had gotten his autograph the second year when I had gone back I asked for a photo with him and while I was crouched next to him he said you'll be hungry later won't you (laughs) 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 I said I guess and he said would you care to join me for a meal afterwards So we went to the White Dog in Philadelphia Mm -hmm. afterwards, and we just, because of my interest in beer and his interest in beer, and then we were talking about all kinds of things, our families, uh, jazz, rugby league, Mm -hmm. all (laughs) kinds of stuff. (laughs) And we started then seeing each other after that. I went to the Spinnerstown Hotel where he was giving another beer dinner and tasting. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Victory Brewing. There were a whole slew of of, um, events that he was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. And I went there and one thing led to another. And before you know it, we were talking every day on the phone. We were meeting in New York City when he was doing um, things that he was at the Algonquin Hotel and at the... Um, at the Gons Fort for uh, Miller Brewing. Mm. Um, it was a competition that was there. Um, I, was, I was a beer taster, so I tasted at the Great American Beer Festival. Mm-hmm. We were there. I went over to England for the Great British Beer Festival. And, you know, it would, just went from there. So everything I'm I'm hearing from the two of you and and what we heard earlier from Dave Broom as well is there was this magnetism to Michael. Is is that fair? Is is that the right way to say it? Is that what both of you saw and encountered and and then um, experienced when you travelled with him as well? Yeah. I would say that that was true. I'm sorry, Hans. Did you want to talk first? Ladies first. Go on. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so because there was, um, you know, of course, he was such an interesting person. I held him in such high regard to begin mm. with. He was like, when he was at the Penn Museum giving his tutor tasting, he was like this very knowledgeable professor. And he had actually gotten to the Penn Museum because. He knew Dr. Patrick McGovern and Solomon Katz. He he was talking with them Mm. before this about the origins of beer. And then he had Mm. met Bruce Nichols through Rosemary Serto at Dock Street Brewery. And because of that, Bruce Nichols thought it would be a great idea if they started doing tutored beer tastings. Mm. 
Mm. And so they actually had 3,000 people every year Whoa. for these tastings. 3,000? 3,000. Wow. They did them in three, three sets of 1,000 people each. Oh, my goodness. And this was every year for 17 years that he did this. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, I never so knew to those me, numbers. it was... <laughs> to to think that, you know, when I was crouched next to him and him asking me to have a meal with him, <laughs> just was like, <laughs> I get it, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so charismatic and yeah. there was, he, he knew everything about every um, country. There wasn't anything that I could research and write about that he hadn't already done. Hmm. He was everywhere in the world. I mean, he, you talk to people, Toshi Ishii in, in uh, Japan, or, or um, who he then moved to Guam, and now I believe he moved back to Japan. Uh, all these people from everywhere in the, in the world all knew him, or he knew them, or knew of their beer. Hmm. And hmm. he was such a, a researcher. He picked up not just on the beer, but he was a person who cared about the people mm -hmm. and the stories. And yeah. that's what was so interesting about him because his stories were so um, beautiful and magnificent. And he had a way of putting things into words mm. that, like nobody else. Like in his, uh, when he was, uh, at a party for Playboy magazine in the mm. early 80s, he had been talking to a, the publisher of Playboy magazine, and he said to him, well, you know, beer is chic. And um, so before you knew it, they had him writing an article, Beer Chic. So, wow. you know, and then I do have just an excerpt from it just to sort of tell or to illustrate how he wrote and he had said beer is as if it were a temptation of eve like sex good beer is a pleasure that can be better appreciated with experience in which variety is both endless and mandatory the pleasure lies too in gaining the experience the encounters with the unexpected the possibility of triumph or disaster, the pursuit of the elusive, the constant lessons, the bittersweet memories that linger. That's how he wrote. That's how he wow. talked. Yeah. And when was That's that published, lovely, lovely, Carol? Lovely. That was 1983. 83, wow. Yeah. He had, so yeah. He, he was magnificent. Yeah. Well, he had a career as a journalist mm -hmm. first. Uh, that's where we could exchange uh, experiences too um <laughs> he, t he told me once when he was um you know wallace milroy was the first who made a malt whiskey companion i think it was in 1985 and michael told me and later wallace corroborated that story to me when i met him in 2000 uh, michael said yeah well wallace called me and uh asked me to be the co-author of the malt whiskey almanac he was assembling and i said mm -hmm. to him i'm sorry i don't have time i'm i have to finish my book on beer first <laughs> so michael was acknowledged as a beer writer first but he also told me yeah i had this idea but my publisher where i was working for i i coined the idea of a, a book on beer and then my publisher said uh, beer people don't read and that was end of story. So that's how I ended up mm. with Dorling Kindersley because they thought beer people would would be would be reading, and we know now mm. they do. They do. Yeah. Is, is that is yes? And that is it's a testament to Michael Jackson that in 1980 there were about 50 beer companies in the United States, and now there are well over 5,000. And if you yeah. if you also count the tap rooms, there are over 8,000. That's amazing. So you could see what kind of influence he had. I had written an article, uh, a, a uh, journal article, in the Journal of Brewery History, 
mm-hmm. in the UK about Michael Jackson and called him the um, father of the craft brewing renaissance in America, and he truly was. Mm. I can say, in, so, and I think mm. you will agree with me, Carol, that in the U.S. he was far more known for, for his beer books and his knowledge about beer mm. than uh, than whiskey. Yes, absolutely. Was it yes. was it true at the time that beer drinkers weren't reading, or was there nobody writing for beer readers at that time? Yep. Good question. Well, you know, um, there was one beer writer who, uh, there was um, Eckert, who had written about beer styles prior to Michael. Hmm. So there Mm -hmm. were, I mean, you can't say there were no beer books, but the beer books that were out there were not, they didn't use the kind of descriptive language that Michael mm-hmm. used. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. didn't tie it to the emotions like Michael could. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Hans certainly knows some of the lexicon that Michael created for the beer business was, it was his unique uh, way of connecting beer to everything. He wouldn't just talk about beer styles. He would talk about beer styles in relation to their flavors, in relation to the aromas that they gave off, Mm -hmm. in relations to how the hair stood up on the back of your neck when you had a particularly wonderful beer, and how it was then connected to the culture of specific areas and how it took in the terroir Mm -hmm. of every area. You know, he was the one who captured that. And that's why people started reading about beer and buying these beer books. And now, you know, there have been a lot of beer writers. There were a lot of um, bloggers, of course, and 2020 changed a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I'm sure that that's going to turn around again. Mm. Yeah, you could could say it was the same with with whiskey. There weren't that many writers who who, uh, described uh, flavors and aromas and how to discern them. There were some beautiful technical books, like the Moss and Hume book, uh, which was from the late 80s, I think. Yeah. Um, there was Helen Arthur, the first female whiskey writer who did a, a malt whiskey companion. There was Wallace, mm-hmm. and there was, um, there was Michael. No, and there was no Jim Murray. He came out with a whiskey Bible. I think the first one was in 2004 which was Mm -hmm. almost two decades later, although he wants us to believe that he actually invented whiskey. Let's not go. (laughs) That's the the latest uh, gossip. I know, that's very true. (laughs) (laughs) So Michael was at the forefront there. And when you go back in in, uh, whiskey literature, I have a a library of over 600 uh, whiskey books, also the Japanese edition of the Malt Whiskey Companion. I'm that kind of geek when it's about whiskey books. Um, <laughs> the first book I found um, where attention was given to the flavor of whiskey was from George Sainsbury. That was a book, mm. uh, Notes on a Cellar book from 1920. Mm. And mm. after that, not that much happened. Well, we had N.A.S. McDonald, we had uh, Bruce Lockhart, couple of more but here again like with the beer i think uh, mm-hmm. michael really set the tone and i find it sad that when he passed away dorling kindersley tried to make money off a sixth edition of the companion i spoke to uh, uh two of the three authors because they called me and they said hans uh what do you think about that are we going to do that said, so, well, they had called Dave, they had called me, and we both said, we're not going to touch that. That's, that was Michael's. And yeah. these two writers, they said, well, we, we would like to do that. What do you think of it? They said, well, if you, if you want to capitalize on his name, that's not going to happen. The only one who's capitalizing on it is Dorlin Kindersley. But uh, if you really want to do it, ask Dorlin Kindersley, said, name it the new malt whiskey companion based upon the original works of Michael Jackson. And then I think you can mm-hmm. add something. They didn't. Mm-hmm. So out of uh, uh, pure uh, anger, I didn't 
purchase the 16. <laughs> 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 and then so, someone sent it to me, uh, do you want to do a review, Hans? I said, no, I'm not going to do a review. Come, come with that. <laughs> so I, I want to switch gears for a second here. Um, normally when we have guests on, we're able to ask them uh, an opening question. And that opening question is typically what was your spark, right? What was it that drove you to this thing that we're discussing now? And unfortunately, Michael isn't here now. And so for us and for our listeners, you know, Carol, I, I loved your story of, of going out to dinner with Michael and you're talking about everything. And I, I wonder if you could share uh, some of that story. I wonder if he talked about his sparks, what, what, how he fell in love with beer, how he fell in love with whiskey, and, and how that drove him. Yeah, I wonder if you could share some of that with us. Well, he was a young man. He was a, um, when he was a teenager, you know, of course, he saw the men next to the big newspaper printing company, and they would be in and out of the pub. The pub was connected to the printing company, <laughs> and he would, you know, see them going in there and he would go in there too and hang out and act like a man also. <laughs> and he could hear the, the roar of the presses in the next room. And that just ran through his blood. Like, you know, and I understand that because I also am in printing. Mm -hmm. And so that was another connection that he and I had. And when the, those big web presses start rolling, there is something about the presses and, you know, the sound just going through your blood and the ink on everybody's fingers and that kind of stuff. Mm. And so he was so excited about being around these other people. And they were always drinking beer and talking about wine. Mm. And he didn't <laughs> understand why they would write about wine. But when they were relaxing, they were drinking beer. <laughs> so... <laughs> He started, he went and pitched a story to one of the editors of the, I think the Batley and Morley Gazette it was. And I don't, you can't even find any reference to that place anymore. But he went and pitched a story for This Is Your Pub. And so he would write about different pubs. And because he was, even though he was underage for drinking, because he was writing these stories, he had to go into these pubs and find out about them and drink the beer. And before you know it, he was saying, why was nobody writing about beer? I'd love to write about beer. But then he was a journalist also. Mm -hmm. he, had, um, he was working on Fleet Street and... He went to, they sent him to the Netherlands and they sent him mm. to, he was in um, uh, Bangladesh mm. where he was kidnapped for a time in a taxi and he wasn't sure he was going to even live. Oh, and, uh, you know, all these <laughs> crazy, he had all these crazy stories and everything. But eventually he landed in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Or in, uh, I guess it was when he was in the Netherlands, actually, doing his story on the legalization of, um, what was it, Hans? The legalization of sex stores and that kind of thing. Yeah, or coffee shops <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yeah, we're very, something we're very like that. very good at that, yeah. Yeah, That's something more than like tulips that. in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he was uh, talking to people about where they got interesting beer. And uh, he saw a man in a John Lennon mask on a train, and he asked him about, about what was going on. And he decided that he was directed to go to Belgium. That's where to find the really good beer. Mm. And so he went to Belgium, and he found that it was so different than the beer that he had tried and that mm -hmm. he was used to and he started writing about that and that was sort of what started him into his career on beer writing hmm. yeah at That's the time the dutch thing. didn't the dutch only made pilsner they didn't really make beautiful mm. beers like duvel or hoogarden or 
Orval. Okay. I have an or- Orval story later on. Uh, please remind me. I have to tell that story is important. Um, but this the spark. Um, what Michael told me this the the whiskey spark. He said, Hans, you won't believe this, but uh, I once uttered the words, I don't like whiskey. And that happened when he was with, with an... <laughs> uh, well, Bill Gates said, internet is not interesting one time. <laughs> Another famous saying, there yeah. you go. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what happened was, uh, it's connected to the story that uh, Carol just told when he was with an older colleague in the, in the pub. They were they were doing half and halves, and so the guy said, uh, "You uh, you have a whiskey," and then Michael said, "I don't like whiskey because he he'd had the wrong stuff and he was much younger." But the guy said, "You never tasted the real stuff. I'll give you something that you will really like." So that was a single malt called Glen Grant, his mm. first ever. And he said, "When I had a wee taste of that, there was so much flavor. There was so much going on." I I became interested, so a colleague ignited the spark with Glen Grant. When I turned mm. fifty, uh, my younger brother gave me a fifty-year-old Glen Grant, and Michael happened to be in uh, in the Netherlands, so we decided to open that bottle uh, for the occasion. So the three of us had the first uh, three drams out of that bottle. And then my brother got one later on, of course. But, uh, he was not available at the time. Was it any good, Hans? Wow. Uh, emotionally, it's one of the best uh, I've ever drunk. Um, it was, taste-wise, it was over-oaked, it was spicy, it was thin. But mm-hmm. the three of us drinking that one on my 50th, 50-year-old, can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's a context yeah. really matters. Yeah, it's it does. And, that's, <laughs> and, and that is something that uh, Michael taught me too, and um, Carol already addressed it. Uh, when I did my first tastings, it was you gotta you take this and this and this more on the flavor and the drinking. But when I um, I accompanied Michael to his tastings, I more and more understood the power of a good story. I was very young at the time. Uh, in my early career of whis- as a whiskey writer, and I've always been a storyteller at heart. I like to combine things, whiskey, to another domain, as you know from from my books. But Michael showed me by giving a, a tasting that he was talking about things that happened in wherever he he went. Uh, he mm-hmm. wanted to convey an experience and not uh, the the empty whiskey tasting. Uh, and I, just by listening and uh, making notes, I began to understand that I have to do something else in my tastings too, because you have to bring something else. The experience is far broader than the little amount of liquid you have in a glass. Mm-hmm. And he was, a, yeah. he was a master at that, but he also often said to me, Hans, you have to kick my shins under the table because I tend to... Uh, elaborate on topics that have nothing to do with whiskey at all. <laughs> so I, I would kick him <laughs> under the table and he said, yes, indeed, uh, let's move on to the next round. <laughs> like the scrum of the of rugby league. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, no, don't, t- don't talk about rugby. Please, please, no rugby. <laughs> but he also told me, told me a very moving story. I didn't know that. Carol will, will know that for certain. Michael's parents came from Lithuania, and Michael was one of a twin, and I think his his twin brother was stillborn, or no, his he, his twin brother died when he was four years when old. He was three years old. So, that, yes, he was, and Michael was the weak one. They expected that he would be the one that would die, but he didn't. Mm. But his brother mm. did. Um, yes. Well, he he would talk about these things too, not not to to evoke uh, a feeling of, of pity or whatever, but he wanted to share these these things. And it also, he wondered why he was the stronger of the two. Uh, interesting. Mm. He would introduce mm. himself sometimes uh, with a famous one-liner. I'm a Lithuanian a- atheist Jew, because he came from a, 
<laughs> Jewish family, and then nobody knew right. what denomination he was. Well, he was his own de- denomination, the Church yes. of Whiskey and, uh, and Beer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the Church of. As a matter of fact, he was. He would say that he was from the Church of the Holy Goat, because <laughs> early on, when they were bringing celebrator from um, from mm. Germany, Franz Inselkammer had developed uh, Doppelbach for the United mm-hmm. States. Mm-hmm. And what's his name? Uh, Finkel, Charles Finkel. Charles and Roseanne oh, Finkel from, had started. Uh, bikes in Seattle. Yeah. They're great yes, people. Yes, they, yeah. had, they had started Marchand du Vin in the United States, and they were importing beer. And so when they wanted to import this beer into the United States, Michael said we should call it celebrator <laughs> and we could put a little goat around the neck and yeah. we can say that that's the holy goat so he was from <laughs> yeah. the church of the holy goat <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that story uh, yeah and he was <laughs> and he would say that uh you know he was a great reader too he read so much and he was saying that he wanted to be like in the ginger man where he wanted to just after he died, just disintegrate in a vat of beer. <laughs> I think there might be laws against that, but maybe not. <laughs> well, that's not what happened after he passed away, but <laughs> that was his fantasy. <laughs> yeah, and when, when Michael passed away for a couple of weeks, it wasn't clear what his wishes were, so he didn't immediately... Um, he was cremated in the end... Uh, yeah. But it t- took some weeks, and nobody could tell when it was. And Becky and I decided to go on holiday in France. And we just arrived at our place where we wanted to stay. And three days later, I got an email uh, with an invitation if we would want to come over for the memorial service. And, of mm. course, mm. Uh, we we got to the airport uh, with our car, flew from Charles de Gaulle, which I never use. It's horrible, horrible. Uh, airport but you had to do something and then in London uh, we first met Carol so the three of us spent uh, time a very very emotional time uh, because we all three of us felt on our own level uh, the loss of a, of a dear dear friend um, yeah and I think we we had a lot of support from each other and that's also why uh, Carol Becky and I became very close if you experience something like that Mm, that's sure. right and then afterwards uh, Becky and I flew back um, well we didn't want to go back to our uh, uh, the place where we were having uh, our holiday we just felt we want to go home now at the time we were driving a little BMW uh, X3 you know the little roadster mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. halfway in the Champagne region on our way to the Netherlands the exhaust pipe just said I'm going to live my own life bye bye <laughs> <laughs> so it was a horrible noise oh so we, we were going to go off the highway and we picked the first B&B in the Champagne but there was a kind of a Champagne festival we couldn't get any accommodation so we kept driving and then there's a little nook of Belgium sticking out into northern France and that's where we mm-hmm. crossed the border little little road um, we ended up on a little square of a small small village uh Mm-hmm, devant Orval and I noticed there was a, a Harley bike in front of a B&B and it said we speak Dutch so Becky was just going to try here if there's really a biker he's going to help me with my exhaust pipe I'm sure so yes yeah. they were um, Dutch people she used to have a restaurant in the Netherlands and he was a, he was a police officer on a bike but they all, both had a burnout, and then they left, started the B&B, and he helped me with uh, fixing uh, the car in a way that we could go to the Netherlands without being pulled over. Wow. So the next morning, I said, where are we? Well, it's Filet de Vente Orval. He said, well, I know Orval, it's a beer. He said, yes, down the road, there's the Abbey. I said, Becky, yeah. we, oh, knew, we knew Michael loved Orval. He said, we're going to pay an extra tribute to Michael. We're going to visit Orval, um, uh, the Abbey, and oh. buy some beer there. Uh, yeah. We did, and for four or five years, uh, usually 
in autumn, we would go back to the uh, B&B, wow. visit Orval, load up the car for a lot of friends and for ourselves, and uh, drank one on, on, on Michael's uh, memory. Yeah. Wonderful. That's, That's amazing. That's really cool. That's amazing. Well, you know, Michael had written about Orval, of course, in his mm -hmm. Great Beers of Belgium book. He had received the Mercurius Award from Crown Prince Philippe of Belgium for that book. He had so many awards that he had won yeah. over the years. He wrote something like 18 major titles in 23 languages. He had received so yeah. many awards. He had gotten the uh, Andre Simon Award, of course, in 2006. He won the James Beard Award here in the U.S. for his mm. book on whiskey, A Definitive Guide. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten, of course, the Golden Tankard Award and several Brewers Recognition Awards, Institute of Fermentation Studies in the U.S. He had such a huge uh, amount of awards that he had won. And when you went into his office, of course, it mm -hmm. was absolutely cluttered all the walls all the tables all the bookshelves were cluttered with awards and um, photos of him and magazines and books whiskey bottles beer bottles whiskey you know it was it was an incredible <laughs> experience just to be in that room and that entire bunch of his his whole archive of information including even steno books that he wrote in shorthand on when he took notes and that kind of thing were, are now all at Oxford in England. Which is, oh, wow. which is wonderful hearing about that collection, oh, yeah. you know, have, having a location. But, but I tell you, Carol, yeah. and listening to you here kind of reinforces this for me, it's, and, and really why we wanted to do this episode as well, is even with all the accolades, even with all the achievements, Whenever Josh or I have talked to anybody, brought up the name Michael Jackson, people talk about the man first and foremost. And then all of those other things obviously come along. But the way people talk about Michael, you know, Josh and I often talk and we, we say it in other parts of this episode, it's such a regret that neither one of us ever got to meet him ever got to attend one of his tastings. You know, I really feel like it's missing yes. from my whiskey life. But as I'd said previously to Dave as well, I cut my teeth, my whiskey teeth, on the Malt Whiskey Companion, the third edition. Mm -hmm. And I, even to this day, anytime I open those books, I feel like I've got Michael right behind me, helping me along my journey. And so speaking to, to both of you, speaking to Dave, speaking to others about Michael, I just, I love the fact that the man remains so much of this industry and so much a part of so many people's journeys, whether it be whiskey or whether it be beer. And I, I love the fact that he remains and that we can still talk about him and celebrate him. Well, Michael was from very humble beginnings, as, as uh, Hans had said. His father drove a lorry, mm -hmm. as he called I'm with it. You. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, inside, that was their only mode of transportation. And inside the cab, there was no separation between the people and the engine. Mm. <laughs> Gosh. And so he and his mother and he and his and his he his mother, his father and his sister then would ride around in this thing and his father would he would come home with bolts of um fabric that fell off the truck when he was delivering it and his mother would make him these little fine woolen suits. <laughs> And the kids would, of course, make fun of him because he had these little fine suits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, but it was, and she would sell fr fries out of a little apartment that they had on the street. People would come in and she would make food and like fries and sell them to them mm. and wrap them in paper. And mm. they were very poor. And so for him to, have even done anything with his life is just 
an amazing thing. But he was always, always there to help people, to um, give them an extra push. He, you know, women who were in the writing about beer, like myself mm -hmm. and others, he thought that was great. He didn't try to push you out or anything like that. He tried to elevate you and tried to help yeah. you and talk with you about it. When he was, um, he was judging at the, I think it was the part, Bartender of the Year Awards up in New York City. And it was, there was, um, it was a competition in which Miller Brewing was running it. And there were three finalists. This had been going on for a while, but there were three finalists. It was a very big deal. And there was one from the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. one from Poland, mm -hmm. and one from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And the one from South Africa was a black man. Skinny, you know, you could tell that he didn't have near the opportunities that the other two did. And, but he said that he had such a wealth of knowledge that it was amazing. And so there were three judges. One was, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. That's terrible. It was many years ago. One was mm -hmm. from the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. One was from the United States and Michael Jackson, of course. And yeah. so the guy from the Czech Republic wanted the Czech guy to win. He was all in favor of him. You know, it's like, um, you know. Uh, Eurovision Song Contest, yeah. Horses choose <laughs> horses, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or whatever, exactly. ducks choose yeah. ducks. And the American was undecided, and Michael had honed in on the man from South Africa. He wanted him. And because he felt that he had so much knowledge, not just about beer and pouring it properly and all that kind of stuff. It was Pilsner or Kell that they mm -hmm. had to do a perfect pour of. Perfect but pour, he yeah. knew all this stuff about whiskey and everything he asked him. The guy knew everything. And so he was really, really going to town for him. And the American judge wasn't sure so they had finally come to a stalemate and huh. decided they would sleep on it and michael of course was so persuasive about why he felt that this young man should be the winner and in the morning the american decided yes he was going to you know um vote on the side of that michael was nice and you know, Michael was so proud of that moment because he felt that there were so many times when um, people of color did not get the same opportunities, and he mm -hmm. wanted this young man to get the same opportunity. That's fantastic. What year was this again? This was in New York City. This was at the yeah. Pilsner Urkel Bartender of the Year Awards, and yeah. I don't remember what year that was, but we had gone to – there was – I believe it was at the American Airlines Theater. Okay. And there was also, or there was something, we went also to the Lucy Awards that year in the same, hmm. that, which were the photography awards. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it was, it was really interesting. And he did that all the time for people to try to help them brewers. He would go visit brewers and he would talk about not only taste their beers but talk about their beers he would do personal tastings and there was even one time when we were at the great american beer festival where a lot of people would give him their beers and want him to taste them for him <laughs> for them and he did he had all these beers he was ready to leave the one year and he had all these beers in the bathroom and he said i don't know what to do i'm gonna just have to taste them and make notes before i go <laughs> <laughs> because he felt that it was important to give everybody yeah. attention yes. and everybody yeah. a chance and everybody to have the opportunity to hear his words and hear what his opinion was because that's what they wanted wow we've got to start closing off the conversation unfortunately i, I mean to be honest i think we can go on for for quite a while <laughs> happily and and I think it's almost a shame that we, that we don't have enough enough time for for all the stories. 
But I wonder if, and, and Jason, I don't want to cut you off. If you had other questions you wanted to, to throw in here, I, did you? I've got a lot more questions, as you can imagine. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up something because Joshua brought it up with Dave and then you, Carol, opened up your article in the, the Beer Hunter Whiskey Chaser with the same thing. And so just just really for, for my own sake, and, and obviously as Josh will be mentioning it as well, the Conan appearances are, are such interesting, I'm just going to say things because I can't think of the exact word right now, but, <laughs> but they're, they're so interesting that you've got Michael Jackson, obviously he walks in and there's the name to riff on right away. And then... You talk in the the article about he's he's is it Golden Shower was the one that he was yes he was it pouring. was Golden Showers and Dogfish Head right yes. and you've got you've got Michael just going straight through this and just delivering it as the beer hunter and you've got Conan and Andy looking for ways to riff and guess on the couch. <laughs> what what did Michael think of those appearances? Did he? Did he think they went as well as you could expect? Did he think they went poorly? Did he think they went brilliantly? What, what, was, what was his feeling coming out of the... I've seen the two appearances on uh, YouTube. I, I don't know if there were more appearances than that, but I've seen two. Um, how did he feel? He always felt that these were fun things for him to do. Okay. You know, because there was so much that was serious where he would talk at the Smithsonian, where he would give talks and and opinions at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. That's a mouthful. <laughs> or <laughs> or, you know, there were there were so many places and so many times when he did serious things. So to do something fun like that, it was just really fun. And he yeah. set it up. He was the one that chose those beers to show. Okay. So he knew where it was going to go. Okay. And I have a funny story for you. I had just started dating Michael right before that one particular Conan appearance. And I had been telling my mother about Michael Jackson and what he meant for beer and all this stuff. And I said, he's going to be on Conan O'Brien. You have to watch this. <laughs> and that's what she saw. It's... <laughs> so she said, okay, then. <laughs> well, well, and you've, you've got Michael with this kind of dry Yorkshire sense of humor, but then that, that, you know, twinkle in his eye, that often would would appear That's over the right. top of the glasses. Um, for you, Hans, you you shared a photo with us that we're we're going to share with the listeners of the podcast. But it's an inscription to you from Michael, where he leads with "idiot" and then exclamation <laughs> point, and then I know there's there's some words after that. That's why I was asking you earlier about the relationship you had and. Clearly, you could you could be brotherly in your back and forth. Yeah. Um, so, as that idiot, that photo, what's happening there? What, what was well, going on? I had uh, finished translating uh, his book, uh, Whiskey, the De Definitive Guide, which is uh, called in the Netherlands the Whiskey Encyclopedia. Um, we had a launch party at the Whiskey Festival in The Hague. Uh, it's three days, so we were both signing books. We were joined by uh, David Wishart, who's sadly no longer among us anymore, who just had released his Whiskey Classified, which I was always also allowed to translate. And um, the day after, we would do a special book signing in a bookshop from a friend of ours in The Hague. Um, uh, we, we would do that uh, with a whiskey tasting and we would jointly present the tasting and the book. So the book was delivered there, about 80 copies for people who were attending and could get a signed copy. And I was leafing through it, and then suddenly I saw there was a, a section of 16 pages in German. <laughs> and I felt so <laughs> embarrassed. I couldn't help it, but you know, uh, Carol knows about printing techniques. They print uh, full-color pages uh, 
and then they print in the different languages in black and white, which saves them a lot of money. Mm. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> and what had happened, apparently, they, they took one section from a different stack of printed papers. And oh, no. So, and I felt so embarrassed. So oh I said to Michael, Michael, there's, uh, someone has done something stupid at the binders. There's one section uh, which is in German. He said, Hans, leave it to me. So he never talked about it. He, he just had all these books signed and sent because it was not in the, in the beginning of the book. And, uh, and then he said, shall I sign one for you too, Hans? I said, I'd, I'd be delighted. And then he wrote in the book, you idiot, Hans. We decided these would be Japanese pages. Like, <laughs> And then I could finally uh, laugh oh, about the whole God. situation that, that I felt so bad, so bad that that just happened with a... With a and I, I had translated the, the big book first and after that uh, I did the, the companion because Michael wanted the fifth and not the fourth to be translated, so... Mm. Mm. That, was, that was Michael's sense of wit. Yeah. He was so funny well, in a very dry yeah. way. And, well, he and I also... Also talked a lot, like I said earlier, about uh, writing, uh, writing prose and writing fiction. So he was interested in my my novels. I've, to date, I've written three novels, and I can tell you, if you want to earn money from writing, that's not the path to go. But it was <laughs> fun doing that. <laughs> um, he, he said, I, I, "I did, I did sell nice. My first novel sold seven thousand copies, so it's not too bad." But my field guide has sold 120,000 copies, so that's much more effective oh. for, mm. especially yeah. Becky loves mm. that, that, <laughs> that I write about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, then um, I have to make a little detour in this story. Um, in 2007, Michael passed away on Becky's birthday, the 30th of August, so that was also mm. very mm-hmm. unfortunate for us. So. The next mm-hmm. year, we didn't want to pay too much attention to it. We were still licking our wounds. But then we wanted to do something more with, with Michael because he had such a position and he was never the person who... He was too modest to say, hey, this is me. I said, what we could do, we, we, his birthday is the 27th of, uh, of March. And that coincides in 2009 with uh, the Whiskey Festival in Northern Netherlands. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to write to some some influential people in the whiskey world if they want to support the idea of Becky and me to found International Whiskey Day as a fundraiser for the Parkinson Disease Society. It was not the rip-off from the other guy who made it into a commercial thing called World Whiskey Day. He, he, he stole our idea, and now he denies that he did. But, uh, that, was, that was only sad. I told... Also, I approached Ian Buxton and he said, well, Hans, I'm playing with the idea to make a special book to honor Michael. And that became Beer Hunter Whiskey Chaser. Mm -hmm. So we connected uh, the founding of World Whiskey Day to um, the, and I'm going to show you something in a minute, to the the launch of uh, Beer Hunter Whiskey Chaser. And all uh, the six beer writers and the six uh, whiskey writers, they all, refrained from royalties and everything uh, apart from the, the actual costs of making the book went to the Parkinson Disease Society so it was a beautiful fundraiser and it had a connection to to Michael um, uh, well what he died of the consequences he died of so I thought well what shall I write because we were we didn't we weren't asked to write a specific thing we could do whatever we wanted but it had to be original not published before I thought well since we talk, we, we we talked a lot about writing fiction. I always said fiction needs facts to support them, and facts need fiction to make them more palatable. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought, well, I'll write a little uh, piece of fiction, uh, and that became the the short story uh, Abuna. Uh, I don't know if you've had time to read it. Yet, I but it's, did. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. So it was. <laughs> Totally different, but I, I really wanted to do that to honor him, and uh, in in another kind of writing than what we usually did. So it worked. We were very happy. Uh, we approached all the 
whiskey writers and the only one who refused was Jim. Um, I, I, I phoned him and said, Jim, we're going to do this. We would appreciate if you support the idea. And he said, I'm not going to beatify Michael. I'm out. And that was it. I said, okay, if that's your opinion. But that's the reason I sent you the official poster announcing uh, International Whiskey yeah. Day. You, mm -hmm. His name is missing, and it's not because we didn't approach him. It's because we... He didn't. He didn't want to participate. Now I'm going to show you something. Uh, one sec. This is great. <laughs> it's drinking time. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll show you this bottle. Uh, this was specially bottled for International Whiskey Day. Ah. Um, um, at the time, um, it was amazing because Martin was there, uh, Dave was there, Charlie was there, uh, Carol was there myself and we all had held a speech in honor of Michael and this this was the whiskey that was especially bottled for the occasion um, wow. and that for us was a beautiful way to give Michael something posthumously say hey mm -hmm. Dave always says big guy and he looks up to the sky but <laughs> yeah that was, that was for the big guy yeah wow that, that's special wonderful um, <laughs> Truth be told, I have to get on another Zoom call in three minutes. <laughs> um, so so I, I would need to leave. But the question that I was going to ask was if you guys could share a story about Michael. And then you went ahead and, and, and did just that, sharing a personal story. So this, so this is lovely. But I, I have one last question for you. There are many pictures of Michael and, and some drawings of Michael where he's doing this. <laughs> he's looking over his glasses. Always. And my question to you is, briefly, what does that look mean to you? <laughs> or can it have multiple meanings? Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. He would look like that and you know, glimmer in his eye because we would always make fun with and of each other. So, you're not going to pull my leg there, are you? Or <laughs> he would be very listening very intently to a story. Yeah. Or maybe he was coming up with one of his funny one-liners. There were many, many uh, Jackson looks like this that could mean <laughs> a, a multitude. And I'm sure Carol has, yeah. has other uh, uh, <laughs> memories about... Him, but it was typical of Michael. And I once said to him, they don't fit well, your glasses, are they? They're always sliding down your nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I have one time that Michael had his glasses down like that, that is burned in my memory, and that is when he his glasses had slid down like that, and he had he was holding both of my hands and looking at me over the glasses with his bright blue eyes. And he said, Carol, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that's what that look means to me, no matter <laughs> when I think about it. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. Wonderful. Raise wonderful. the hair you, on my arms. Yeah. That <laughs> same. You remember you were talking about the hair on your neck yeah. going up when you taste it? There too. Oh, oh yeah. That's the yeah. same feeling. Thank you, Carol, feeling, for Carol. sharing that. that. Is Thank the, you. What yeah. a perfect end to a wonderful, mm. wonderful conversation and and remembrance. And and sincerely thank you both for sharing Michael with me and with us and with our listeners. Just really wonderful to feel a point of access. So thank you, sincerely. Well, it means a lot to me that you guys followed my suggestion and invited Carol because, well, oh. I couldn't have done it this way without Carol. And I'm so happy to see you, see you're healthy and enjoying life, Carol. We should do this more often and the guys shouldn't be here, but you and I. <laughs> yeah, we should. <laughs> All right, okay, we can take a hit, we can take a hit. Jason, Jason <laughs> Joshua, thank you so much for having yeah. us. Hans, thank you for inviting me as well. Uh, goes without saying. It's, it's a wonderful experience. Time with Dave Broom 
with Hans and Carol, remembering the late, great Michael Jackson is time well spent. Time well spent. You know, really quickly, just just going back, looking again through the emails that Hans had sent with some of those pictures of, of him and Michael. The one, I think there were two actually, the pictures that really got me were of of the inside of the book where where Michael just writes, you know, nice nice little quick personal note to Hans. And that just struck that gets me in the feels. It gets me in the feels every time I look at it. So yeah. It was a special time, man. What did you what did you get from them? What, what what's your takeaway? It's it's the same thing that drives you and I on in this industry. Personal connection. Mm. The way they talk about their own connections with Michael Jackson. Yeah. Like yep. that's when you and I first entered the industry, and, and we've said it many, many, many times on the podcast. When you and I got into this industry, it was so welcoming. And it was a it was a lift up kind mm. of industry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and I think we touched on that in our in our conversation with Dave, where when he starts talking to Michael Jackson about a potential career here in the spirits world, Michael Jackson's trying to lift him up, right? Yeah, what, yeah. what can I do to, to help you with that? And, and so then, and then you hear the, you hear similar things from, from Hans uh, and Becky and Carol and, and for Carol to be the beer Fox and have that type of connection <laughs> with Michael Jackson, yeah. the beer hunter, yeah, you know, so that, that's that's really my takeaway, and that's really what I wanted to get out of of these conversations. Was who was Michael Jackson the person? Because I've got his books, you know, I've yeah. I've read his written word, I've read his tasting notes, yeah. yep. in Whiskey Magazine, yeah, yep. And so it's it's going beyond that, and and these wonderful, wonderful, kind, generous people certainly made those connections. So I thank them most sincerely for that. With that thought of kind and generous in mind, I may have, I may have mentioned this on the Keepers of the Quake episode. I, I, don't, I don't recall. But in leading up to our conversation with, uh, with Hans and, and Becky and Carol, of course I told Haida about it and I told her about the episode that we're doing here. And as soon as I brought up Hans's name, Haida's face lit up. Because when we were at the Keepers of the Quake banquet, and now, you, of course, you were there as, as a, my guest as well. But when you go into the, the room where they do the ceremony of, of welcoming you into the Keepers of the Quake, you're only allowed one guest can't have the two guests that you invite. And actually I had three guests, right? Because Stuart Nickerson was with us, of course. Indeed. And and so, of course, I selected my wife to be with me in that room rather than my uh, my best friend and business partner. Slash work wife. Slash work wife. But Hans was there in the room and sat next to Haida and basically took her under his wing just so she had someone to be with. Wonderful. While I went Wonderful. up there, and right, it just talks to the 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 type of the type of person that Hans is. And getting back to your initial point of when we first got into this industry and how welcoming it was, and how people look to lift people up. As wonderful as Hans is, he's not alone. That's that's the bulk of our industry. Lovely yeah. people looking out for one another. And that was just so evident in these, in these conversations. It really was. Agreed. Yep. yep. Nothing yep. further to add. I'm just, uh, I'm just Good. sitting comfortably and happily in all of those words. Well, let's, let's move over to the news because if we don't move over soon, I'm going to start crying. So let's sure. go to the news. As we sit here towards the end of March, we've had (laughs) 
I'm going to say four mm -hmm. very successful SCNO online releases. And the reason I'm going to say four is because we had a great Invergordon 46-year-old. Mm -hmm. We had a great Thornton rum, kosher mm -hmm. for Passover, mm -hmm. which begins in just a few days. Mm -hmm. And we had a very successful Ben Nevis six-year-old. So okay. that's three. That's three. However, we did all the shipping of our 1,200 bottles of unrevealed Kentucky bourbon. Mm-hmm. In this year. So we have cleared our decks of all four releases. Yes. 1,200 bourbon, 150 grain, about 300, 320 K for P rum, and 750 Ben Nevis. Which we're still, that's still shipping. It's not still shipping. By the time this goes live, we have one more day of spreadsheet. Look at that. All so right. when I say clear the decks, mm. all the shipping spreadsheets have been done. <laughs> and, and it's sitting squarely with our shipper. So, so what that has allowed us to do, along with the four-month suspension of tariffs, mm -hmm. is move as quickly as possible on our seventh U.S., retail release Correct. for single cast nation and we in this new segment have some distillery names to share from labels that have been approved <laughs> by the united states government ttb uh -huh. wing oh, i am so excited about this release because it involves five it, it involves Jesus, Jason, we have never bottled any of any whiskey from these distilleries before. Now, in a way, I take that back because one of the releases is from a distillery we've bottled from before. However, that distillery produces various different types of single malt scotch whiskey. We've just never done this specific one. So I am I am nodding my head. Yes, because you are correct. So the first one, so here, let, let, let's go through it from top to bottom. We have a 10-year-old Blair Athol from a sherry mm. butt with good color on it, if, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. And then we have a 16-year-old from an undisclosed Highland distillery. I, I can't, we can't say too much. Here, this is what I'll say. On the label, it will say it's Westport, so that is the code name for this distillery. And the other thing that I will say is, and you may have met him before, I have a friend named Glenn who loves as many oranges as he can get. He's like, give me more oranges and I'll be happy. I'm like, okay, Glenn. And anyway, Glenn really likes whiskeys from this distillery. Okay. Uh, and that's a 16-year-old, also from a sherry butt. <laughs> I just wonder what kind of nickname you give someone like that. Glenn, who likes more oranges. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We just call him Glenn More Oranges. Anyway, <laughs> then <laughs> there's a 13-year-old in this one. I'm in insanely excited about this is a distillery that doesn't get enough attention and that's uh the Inchgower distillery and this is from a a port a tawny port um hogshead so real incensey kind of you know earthy floral kind of experience with that one uh and then we have an 11 year old another sherry butt from the linkwood distillery and this is from refill sherry so don't don't be confused when you see the bottle. It says sherry, but the liquid is light, but it is oh so liquidy. So if you like liquid, this is definitely going to be up your alley. And I'm, now he, I'm, I'm yeah. holding up the sample that we selected from right now. And no. yes, if you just handed that to me on the street and said, ex bourbon or ex sherry, 
let me just say, I would not say egg sherry. But <laughs> you stick some ex-bourbon next to it and maybe there is a subtle hue in there. Maybe, maybe. So the, the fifth one, and this is the one I was alluding to in the opening here, this one is called Inch Fad and is from the Loch Lomond Distillery. So thus far we've we've bottled some of their Crofting Gaia spirit, we've bottled some of their Inch Marin spirit, but we've never bottled Inch Fad. So Inch Fad is their heavily peated spirit that goes through their Lomond stills, whereas Crofting Gaia is their heavily peated spirit that goes through their Copper Pot stills. So that's that's the subtle difference between the two. Inch Fad tends to be a bit softer, a bit f- fruitier. And then finally, we have... Before? A, oh, there's a fun connection <gasps> with the inch fad that connects US retail with US online. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't I can't believe I didn't bring this up. You're right. The whiskey's 15 years old, but it spent the last 4 months of its life in the Grand Cru Bordeaux cask that previously held our 8-year-old Pendaren. So Peated Scotch whiskey, 15 years in bourbon, then four months in a cask that previously held Welsh whiskey that previously held Grand Cru Bordeaux. That's that's pretty cool. It's like a, it's a very meta whiskey. Oh, it is. And, and what I really like is uh, one of the questions we get the most is, so what's the difference between your retail line and your online line? <laughs> and, and, and we always give the answer to that. Here we are blurring that line a little bit mm. and bringing the two worlds together. The only thing that we're not blurring, however, is all of the whiskeys that I've mentioned thus far, and then there's one more. These will be for retail shelves only. They will not be sold through the Single Cast Nation website. There, there are four whiskeys we are about to release, and we'll talk about those in a second, that will be for online, but these are for retail. So... Finally, Mr. Silver Lining, thank you again. Thank you. you saved me. You saved me once more. Uh, we we have a twenty year old single grain from the Dumbarton Distillery. Again, another another distillery we've never bottled whiskey from. Yep, yep. And Dumbarton, known for their corn distillate, exactly. before they they unfortunately became a closed distillery, but very heavy spirit mm-hmm. from Dumbarton, mm-hmm. really. Really excited to get that shared uh, with with fans of the nation. That's interesting. You know, Port Port Dundas was also, I think, like Dumbarton stuck to corn, and they too they closed in 2010. That's interesting. Both those distilleries using corn no longer around. <laughs> Maybe corn got expensive. Maybe yeah. corn got expensive. Yeah. And then finally, I wanted to share with our listeners four online releases that we'll be talking more about shortly. We've got two more from the Wild Turkey Distillery that we're about to release, both nine-year-olds, one from Warehouse E, one from Warehouse G, both on the fourth floor, and both. Well, we always like to get a bit off profile with our Wild Turkey, so these will follow suit in that they will be off profile from what you know from Wild Turkey. Yeah, what one of those ones as well where we were writing up our tasting notes, you'd you'd proclaimed a little bit of the old turkey funk on this one, but we'll we'll save the full reveal for another day. Mm-hmm. And while we have a pair of wild turkeys we'll be releasing, we'll also have a pair of Westlands we're releasing. Both of those at seven years of age. One of them is a heavily peated Westland from an ex bourbon cask. And then one is Westland's five malt blend, so unpeated, five different types of malted barley, all seven years in a Muscatel sherry cask. Yeah. 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 That peated was distilled on my birthday. It's a June 27 distillate. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. I also uh, want to say this will be our first collaboration with Westland under Remy Ownership. So you'll see it on the labels, both the Westland and the, I almost said Whistlepig, the Westland and the Wild Turkey will have the Spirit of Collaboration logo on there to show you we're, we're collaborating with the distilleries directly. 
With Just like on our whistle pig and on our balconies. That's right. That is correct. And maybe that's why well, I thought of whistle pig. Uh, there's always a reason. If, if I'm to be a successful silver lining, there must be a reason. So that's all the news that I had, which which is pretty exciting, right? That's 10 new whiskeys. Did you have anything that you wanted to share with our listeners? Just to, to follow up on something that Jess had put in a, a state of the nation for our, our nation members around the world, mm-hmm. is we're still putting together the third UK, Correct. Europe, rest of the world release. So please, please don't think we've forgotten about it. Please know that... Um, I'm actually looking at a sample on my desk that we uh, said to Jess, "Do we have some good news for you?" But I'm I'm going <laughs> uh, I'm going down the the vague book route there, and uh, and I'm I'm going to say no more there. But please please know we're working on it, and you are going to see more releases. And I'm sure one day the stuff that we sent to Japan is going to land. One day, you know, one day, one day. 2025. Who knows? <clears throat> I think now might be a good time to bring up that email that that we teased our listeners about. Yeah, a moment ago in the news segment when we talked about the suspension of tariffs for four months, Mm -hmm. it certainly is a topic that we've heard from a lot of people on uh, and even a, a number of emails coming in. The reason that I've chosen James Foster's email today is that he covered a lot of what was appearing in other separate emails. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've, I've already said he's he's one of, if not the most intelligent guys I know. And so the fact that he would have an email encompassing a lot of detail is not surprising. So, the, so as we always say about James Foster, there's good length to this. And so I'll give you a... I'll give you a a reading here. Hi, guys. American usage of guys. He includes includes Jess. Oh, I thought you you put a Z at the end. Like, hey, guys. Hey, you guys. (laughs) When will we see cheaper whiskey as a result of the tariff suspension? I've been thinking a lot about this. And I think it won't be any time soon. Mm-hmm. And the email unfurls from there. <laughs> I love James Foster with all my heart. For one thing, mm-hmm. retailers probably have a lot of stock on hand that they purchased at prices that were marked up along the supply chain as the pain trickled down from the importers to the consumers. Mm-hmm. Similarly, I bet several distributors have more expensive than usual stock that they couldn't sell to bars and restaurants because dot, 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 COVID. I tell you, James is really using his brain here. He's, he's thinking about what's, he's thinking about the world writ large when he writes this you, out. You, you ain't heard nothing yet. Oh boy. Okay. If these guys buy tariff-free new stock and pass the savings along, their purchasers will probably buy the cheaper new stuff and ignore the tariff-burdened older stock. I would think that's a big incentive to sell the old expensive inventory before any newer, less expensive stuff. Mm -hmm. There's probably even more of that expensive stock sitting around because consumer tastes moved away from good whiskey to cheap booze. That's why scotch sales are down so much. We went from drinking for pleasure to drinking for comfort to drinking to forget. I think we're getting a little bit of a personal insight there. <laughs> and here's my own journey. <laughs> this is great. I feel like we've, we've tagged on an extra, extra episode it does. to, it to One way. Nation. I feel like I'm reading you an article here that we're going to riff on uh, after this. <laughs> James continues. Also, I suspect that some people won't go back to super premium stuff soon. Some have switched to other spirits or cocktails for which cheap booze is satisfactory. I'm not one of those people, just saying. But that reduces demand 
so that sales might not come all the way back even if prices drop. Mm -hmm. And each step in the supply line has become accustomed somewhat to higher prices. Those of us who are still buying tariff tainted booze. I love that expression. I think I might start using that. Tariff That's a TTB. tainted. TTB. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I'm going to think that every time we submit a label to them, we're sending it off to the tariff tainted booze. Um, so purchasers at each level of the supply chain might be able to get away with not lowering prices all the way to pre-tariff mm. levels. In any case, they need capital to rebuild the capacity they lost when demand tanked. So it would be reasonable to leave prices a little higher for a while. And then three quick sentences, and then he's out of here. And, of course, increasing demand in Asia and elsewhere will continue to drive prices up. On the other hand, the impending whiskey loch may reduce prices. So, what do you think? When might whiskey prices go back to pre-tariff levels, if ever? And he signs it, J. the Elder. That is a, a brilliant email. And I'd like to... But do you see I'd what like, I'm saying about he, yeah. he really encompassed a number of different things that we've been yes. getting asked about in one email? Uh, one, 100%. And so he's using all that to inform his question, right? But so let's let's start at the end. I would posit mm -hmm. that the increased demand for whiskey in Asia is less of an issue here than we might be thinking. And I'll use our own shipment to Japan as an <laughs> example. There may be demand for whiskey in Asia, be it Japan or China or Taiwan, etc. The problem is, globally speaking, there is a, a shortage of shipping containers, all of it being a combination of COVID-related and tariff-related. So there may be demand, but there's still less whiskey going into Asia. This is another reason why Scotch whiskey sales overall have dipped by around 33%. The product simply just can't get to its destination. So that, that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two, and now I'm going to leap forward to the beginning of his email where he talks about, okay, the tariffs have dropped away. When will we start seeing the prices come down on the shelf? And he brings up a very good point. A lot of product has already come in with the tariffs on them. So yeah, first a very off, good point. right? So first off, the the retailers, because there's no bars or restaurants, or few bars or restaurants that are open buying the stuff. So let's focus on the retailers. They have to figure out how to sell the product that they have on the shelf that's already at a premium. My guess is retailers are going to feel as if they're put in a position of discounting product, which means that they will likely ask their distributors to help out because they don't want to lose all the money on their end. They, they want to help their distribution partners, which means I'd expect our distribution partners likely reaching out to the importers saying, can we help our friends out in the retail sector? So if the retailer starts to do that and ask the distributor and then the importer to help absorb what they want to discount by, I would suggest that this now tariff-free spirit coming in is not going to come down in price because we need to make up the money that's being lost. And then you add on top of that, this is a four-month lifting of the tariffs. It's it's not set in stone. It's not lifted forever. We don't have that word yet. So I personally don't see anyone taking these now lower cost products and dropping prices anywhere. 
they need to protect themselves. They need to pad their bank accounts to basically to to prepare themselves for the discounting that they may be helping out with on the retail end of it. So with that said, we're looking at August for the the follow-up conversation to be had with the USTR and and with the European Union and of course with the UK. And if at that time the agreement is we will lift the tariffs permanently, my guess is they won't lift it permanently. My guess is they'll probably kick it down the, the road for another four months, six months, 12 months, and it'll go on that for a while. We just need to see more time without the tariffs to see any movement happening. And then this is the last thing that I'll put, and then, and then I'll let you chime in or disagree with me or correct me wherever you see fit. I do see us getting to a point where if we're without tariffs for long enough and retailers and distributors and importers are able to sell through their tariffed product in a quick enough manner that you will see prices come down, but it's going to start with retail shops getting really aggressive with their pricing. If everybody mm. stays normal, right, price drives everything. All you need is, is some of these large chains to say, you know what, this Lagavulin 16, this Kalila 12, this whatever it is. Because price drives everything, we're going to need retailers to take the initiative to start not actually discounting, but putting prices where they should be based on a tariffless price to them, if that makes sense. So let me ask you a follow-up question then that, that I've been thinking about during these tariff times and, and these temporary post or non-tariff times. And, and I agree with you. I, I think we'll go from suspension to either resolution or further suspension because it's, it's such, a, you know, such an important bargaining chip, even though we're the ones getting screwed on this. Yeah. It's a good bargaining chip for those other industries. Maybe tariff their stuff. I don't know. I'm a revolutionary. One thing I will add or remind you of, and granted things may have changed, but there was a 25% tariff on bourbons and American rum and I sure. think I think American brandy into the European Union. Now, those went into effect when the UK was part of the European Union. They are no longer part of the European Union, so I don't know if it applies to UK. I don't know if those tariffs are still on, right? Because we're in the US, we're a bit more focused on our end, but... Well, the good news is yeah. none of this has anything to do with the question that I'm asking you. So this oh, okay. is just a framing of a larger, larger okay. issue. Okay, okay, okay. okay. My, my question to you is when... When the tariffs started, mm. Impex did a wonderful job of buffering the consumer from the tariffs. And we've with, talked about... With Cajon our supplier Man. partners, yes. Correct. And that's what I was going on to... Okay, okay. Then I'll if I okay, stop. Yeah, please. Finish ahead, the question. Just, you do it, Jason. <laughs> you ask five-minute questions. I get 15 seconds in and I'm being corralled. I'm sorry. <sighs> so... <laughs> you ask fucking five minute questions of people <laughs> and they sit patiently while you say okay so there's one time at band camp just this will make sense just <laughs> and then then when i was in a band as a young man it's all coming together and then <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah because i make i make my questions very interesting and contextual you know i'm just trying to Trying to get you I'm glad there. one of us thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in concert with partners, mm -hmm. MPEX really, really buffered distributors, retailers, consumers, right? Correct. Correct. And to, and to what degree is not important? That's a that's a that's a business question uh, for MPEX. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there was work being done there, right? Is there a concern, having protected those parts of the chain, mm -hmm. is there a chance people will look sideways at the numbers and say, why aren't your numbers coming down? 
as opposed to, or, or, or is there enough information? Is there enough back and forth here where no one's really in the dark? Distributors, mm. retailers, consumer, consumers would be the one I would be worried about being in the dark since it's hard to communicate all of this business to them when they're just yeah. trying to buy a bottle of whiskey. So so how does how does that work coming out of it? Is there any concern there that good work was done during tariff times that now might come back to bite on the butt post or suspended tariff times? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really good question and and I agree with you. Um if I have any concerns, it's more on the consumer side than it is on the distribution or retail side because our distributor partners and retail partners know for sure that their pricing hasn't changed. And there have been enough articles in the New York Times and in other publications where Impex was highlighted for doing that as a champion in the whiskey industry over here in the U.S. to say, no, we're not passing this on to our consumers. A few problems is, A, most people are pedestrian drinkers, right? They'll grab a bottle, and if they like it, maybe they'll grab another one. They're not seeking out whiskey news. They're just, they enjoy a nice whiskey, sure. and if the price sure. is good and it tastes good, boom, you move on. Sure. So my hope is that they, the consumer, will just see the prices remain the same, and, and if they picked up Kilhome and Macker Bay or Port Eskay 110 proof or something like that, that they continue to enjoy it. I, the only potential concern that I have, everybody has such a short attention span and, and short memories, right? Uh, I, mm. I can give you a story just earlier today, Jason, where you and I were having a conversation. It was quite clear how short my memory was. My hope is people will remember. And if they don't remember at least during the tariff times, the, the terrible tariff times, triple T. Um, yeah, the tariff-tainted booze times. The tariff-tainted booze times, that they will say, you know what, I, I picked up this because it was less expensive than some of the other Islas, and I like it. And then maybe we have a new fan, right? That, that's the hope, that we now have, we, now we now have a new fan. And, uh, yeah, it's... It's tough. I, it's a slight, con it's a concern with a, with a small C. How's that? One of the things that interests me, and, and I'll, I'll try to make this my last point, and then we can think about getting out of here. But when I was just a consumer, I remember thinking all pricing was driven by the producer. Mm. And so the price that that Glenn Fiddick, that Glenn Livett, that Glenn Morangy, an, an easy, an easy reference point, the price that that sat on the shelf, all came from the distillery in Scotland or or the head office mm. associated with that distillery, and it's so interesting being in the industry and dealing with different parts of the industry, and now dealing with a pandemic and with tariffs. There are so many reasons for the price of that bottle on the shelf being that price. So many reasons, that, yeah. That it is very easy to miss out on what's a retailer doing in this moment on that price? Mm. What's that distributor? What's that importer? What's that supplier? But also, what's that haulage company What's that international shipper? What's that cork company, that glass company, right? The fuel, yeah. right? The fuel pricing. Like, yeah. it's all of it all the time. And so when you get such a smart question from James here, yes, it's very easy to say, the tariffs went away. Let's celebrate cheaper pricing. Nope. No. There's an entire world of reasons for the pricing. And it's like a big ball of yarn that's all knotted and you're just teasing it out <laughs> centimetre by centimetre, inch by inch, untangling knots. It's a complicated business and it's very hard to communicate that to a consumer at all times, in all ways. Agreed 100%. I, I need to throw this in here because anytime someone says step by step, my brain can't help 
but to go there. And 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 this 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 will end the podcast hopefully on a fun and funny note. So I may have told you, I'm sure I've told you, and the listeners may or may not know this, but back in the '90s, I was a huge fan of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and I would go see it every weekend. I think I've seen it somewhere between 70 and 90 times. And when you when you watch it, it's it's an interactive movie, right? The movie's happening, and you have your one liners that you yell out, or right? when the when the the guy in the wheelchair comes out and yells, great Scott, everybody throws a roll of toilet paper, right? Scott toilet paper. And, you know, there's all sorts of things that you do here. Anyway, there's this one scene where Frankenfurter, the main character played by Tim Curry, who, who is a, uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And, and, and in the movie, he's this, uh, transsexual transvestite from a planet called Transylvania, right? That, that's his thing, a transsexual transvestite. Anyway, there's this one part where, where as he's walking, the crowd says, step by step, inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter, transvestite <laughs> by transvestite. And that line always cracked me up. And anytime I hear step by step, and I hear it in like business meetings all the time <laughs> i have to control i have to contain my laughter because all i can think of is you know s- step by step inch by inch transvestite by transvestite so you've well, yeah, just, you, just you, make sure you keep your stilettos under the table that's the always 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 well thank you for making my point with that final story <laughs> <laughs> I know it's totally random, but I wanted to give you and our listeners a glimpse into what happens in my brain when I hear certain certain things. <laughs> uh, I, I'm so used to thanking you at the end of Extra Extra that I'm almost stepping on your toes here to thank our guests, but I will... I will take a, a stilettoed step back and allow you to, to thank <laughs> our guests for today's interviews, words, thoughts, and yeah. good times. Carol, Hans, Becky, Dave, thank you all so much for, for taking the time and, f- and for thinking that these conversations were worth your time to have this remembrance of, of, of a person who... Both Jason and I, we wish that we could have met. We wish we could have shared a beer with or shared a dram with, even if it were for 10 minutes. Your insight, your stories helped tell me a bit more about uh, about this man that I, I, I don't know a lot about except for his writing. And, uh, and I thank you for it. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Second all of that. This episode did exactly, exactly what I hoped it would. And we'll wish a a happy birthday to Michael Jackson for March 27, a happy International Whiskey Day for those who celebrate. And thanks again to our guest. Thanks to James for his email. Thanks to you for all your hard work, Joshua. Until next time. Enjoy Passover and we will go eight days without the grain. I just got my shipment of kosher for Passover rum. Ba-boom. Oh, well done. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, slanja lachaim then. Slanja tov. Oh, your clink is so much better than mine. I've had to make up for previous clanks. <laughs> She was on launch. She was on the the VAMS website and said, she said, you should just make sure you're registered with VAMS because I just made an appointment for the Johnson & Johnson shot tomorrow. And I said, I thought you set me up for VAMS. I said, I did, but it's a two-part process. You have to do the other. And I said, okay, not a problem. So I did the other part and then I went to go sign up for, oh, I did tell you this. Did I tell you this? Then why yes, are, why this are is you- why my face looks... This is why my face looks like this. Then you need to I was stop waiting me. For you, I was waiting for you to get to the point in the story where you were like, 
Oh yeah, I delayed our meeting by 30 minutes while I got more and more frustrated with the website. Yeah, see, you, you need to you need to stop me. Cuz I could have just <laughs> gone on and on if I wasn't looking at your face. I just love the fact you were not present in any part of yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Where were you yesterday afternoon when I was meeting with you? Somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you're going to go along with with Haida today. Yeah, that was your suggestion. That was your from suggestion. the Wild West. That was your suggestion. <laughs> so, so I, I can only imagine later on when they're like, what "The fuck are you doing here? Fuck off!" You'll be like, "Thanks, Jason." Thanks for nothing. Yeah. You'll you'll you will hear my fist shaking in the air. It'll be the it's like the butterfly effect, but it's the fist effect. Yep, I fully anticipate this happen <laughs> when you get publicly humiliated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Uh, okay. One, One elephant, elephant, two elephant, elephant three elephant, elephant, four elephant, elephant five elephant. elephant.